Hello and welcome to the Megacast by Actual Tech Media. Today's topic, assessing and improving data protection, disaster recovery as a service, and disaster recovery capabilities. On this event, you'll hear from experts at ArcServe, Progress, Pure Storage, Zerto, Tierpoint, Rubric, Faction, Commvault, Druva, Nutanix with Haiku, and Clumio. What an amazing lineup of data protection and disaster recovery solutions on the Megacast today. I, I'm just so thankful uh, for all of our expert presenters who have joined us, and I'm so thankful for everyone out there in the audience who took time out of your busy schedule to join us on this Actual Tech Media Megacast event. If you're looking to improve your data protection and disaster recovery capabilities, you are in the right place. We at Actual Tech Media created the Megacast event series to help educate IT professionals such as yourselves about the latest and greatest enterprise technology solutions to help you do it quickly and efficiently without having to leave your home or office and to help get all your questions answered. I mean, we're all former IT professionals ourselves here at Actual Tech Media. We know how tough it can be in the trenches of IT, and we know how, it, how hard it can be to solve your challenges. And the whole point of this event here is to, to help you, to help educate you about these solutions and help to get your questions answered. Before we get started, just a few things that you should know about the event. Um, this is a mega cast, and I like to, to say that we have a, a mega lineup of prizes. I'll be talking about those in just a moment. Um, we do encourage your questions there in the questions pane. In fact, we have our best question prize, which I'll be talking about in just a moment to help encourage those questions. And I will have some questions for you along the way as well. Uh, so we'll have some poll questions that will come up there in the slides window. And we, of course, appreciate your participation in those polls. And then social. We want this to be a social event. You can tweet directly from your console using that Twitter icon on the right-hand side of the console, and the hashtag for today's event, ATM Megacast, will be automatically appended on Twitter. I'll be monitoring Twitter. I will you know, retweet or respond to anyone out there who uh, tweets with, with the goodness that you've learned on the event today. So thank you in advance for those. You can also uh, uh, follow all the actual tech media social channels on the top right-hand side there of your audience console, YouTube, uh, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And of course, uh, we appreciate that. I also want to call your attention to the handouts tab there. It's there that you'll find resources uh, hand selected by our expert presenters, one for each of the different solutions that you'll find on the Megacast today. There are 10 different presentations. There are 10 different links or PDF uh, downloadable assets. So make sure that you go ahead and just download those assets now. That way you'll have them readily available after the event if you want more information. You can also click on the links. Those will open up new tabs or windows in your web browser. So I encourage you to check out those resources. Now, we said this is a mega cast. We've got a, a mega lineup of prizes. In fact, we have four MakerBot Replicator Plus 3D printers to give away. These are, you can make some amazing things with these 3D printers. So uh, kudos in advance to, you know, congr congratulations in advance to anyone out there who wins these 3D printers. And if that's not enough, we also have Amazon $500 gift cards being given out uh, roughly every 30 minutes after each of the 10 different presentations on the event today. So that's another $5,000 in prizes uh, just in gift cards alone. You must be live in attendance to qualify for the prize drawing, and winners will be announced periodically by me during the event and contacted via email after the event. You must, of course, also meet the actual tech media prize terms and conditions that you can find there in your handouts tab. And in addition to those prizes, we also have our 10 Amazon $50 gift cards to give out for our best question prizes as well. We will select a one prize winner for each session on the event today, each Q&A session, uh, where we'll take the best question and uh, we'll contact you after the event via email. Winners must, of course, also meet the Actual Tech Media Prize Policy. And you can find that there in your handouts tab. All prize winners must be able to submit an IRS Form W-9 to Actual Tech Media. 
And of course, you always have the option to make a donation to the selected charities you see here on the screen in the amount of your prize value. So if you win a prize and you want to help someone less fortunate, we would love to help you do that. We've done a lot of that in partnership with the Gorilla Guide Book Club. I'll talk more about gorilla.guide here in just a moment. But first, the hashtag again for the event on Twitter is ATM Megacast. You can follow Actual Tech Media as well. And me, your moderator, David M. Davis. You can subscribe to all the Actual Tech Media social channels as well, including our 10 on Tech podcast over in the iTunes store. And all of our latest and greatest content goes over on LinkedIn, so make sure that you follow us there. I do want to call your attention to the Gorilla Guide Book Club. You can find a link to that there in the Handouts tab, or you can click right there on the screen where it says Explore and Download Now at Gorilla.Guide. This is where you can download easy-to-read enterprise IT books authored by top industry experts, stay up to date on trending enterprise technologies, and learn about some of the most innovative technology uh, in the world today being used uh, in IT organizations around the world. So make sure that you check out these free books. You can download them. Uh, they are full-length educational IT books. I also want to call your attention to the refer a friend link that you'll find there in the handouts tab and also right there at the bottom of the slides window. If you enjoy this event today, you want to share uh, what we're doing here at Actual Tech Media with your IT friends and coworkers, we would greatly appreciate that. We're not going to spam them. Uh, if you enter their email address, we will send them an invitation to join one of our upcoming events and we would love to help them on. So we would love to have them on. So hopefully you enjoy the event today and want to share what we are doing. And now before I introduce you to our keynote presenter, um, we're going to do something here very different, uh, very short, but different. Uh, I want to make a, an offer out there to anyone who is interested in being a moderator here at Actual Tech Media, doing what I'm doing right now, moderating our events, uh, if you have experience in IT, which if you're on this event, most likely you do have experience in IT. If you love to talk to super smart technology people, if you like educating IT pros such as yourselves, and you're comfortable presenting technical information, uh, you don't have to get a haircut just like me. That's okay. Uh, we are accepting jo um, applications over at jobs at actualtechmedia.com. Just email us why you want to be our next event moderator. And if we're interested, we will ask you to submit a video, a demo of why you're interested in joining us. Of course, send us some details on yourself, uh, your, your resume, uh, why you would be a good fit right there, jobs at actualtechmedia.com, your current resume, a short edition of video is what we're asking for and the story of any project you've worked, worked on or a vexing IT business problem that you've solved. And we'll review all the submissions and get in touch with uh, anyone who applies. There's some great benefits to working at Actual Tech Media. You see those on the right side of the screen right there. Uh, some of the notes here that you need to know are you must be a resident of the U.S. or Canada. While we love uh, all of our international friends, the paperwork and legal requirements are crushing uh, for a small company like ours. Um, you don't have to be super technical expert, but we want someone who has real enterprise IT experience, someone who is energetic, loves presenting, and loves talking to techni technical people. So uh, that's the details on the uh, job opening we have right now. I'm not leaving, so don't worry. I'll be your moderator here for uh, many years to come, I'm sure, but uh, we need help. We're doing so many different events. Uh, every week, and we would uh, welcome some uh, assistance with the moderation. So thank you to anyone who's interested. And with that, it's time to kick off our keynote presentation with our special guest, uh, Mr. Gareth Frazier. Take it away, Gareth. A megacast. While the past few years have reinforced the importance of business continuity, during large-scale industry-impacting events. Businesses have had to give more attention to eliminating complex silos, simplifying operations, and reducing costs while meeting their service level agreements. 
We've seen the importance of not only protecting data, but the ability to rapidly recover that data in the event of a crisis. So to begin, let's consider a few points in this context. The value of data assets. Data is the most important digital asset of organizations. It's been projected to reach 175 zettabytes by 2025. So data growth, management, and protection is a top priority for enterprises. Next, consider disaster risk. No organization is immune to outages, severe weather, or security breaches, but most don't have business continuity and disaster recovery solutions that keep pace with their businesses. And then there's service level expectations. The overwhelming majority of organizations can't tolerate more than an hour of downtime for their critical applications. So improving recovery time is a key priority. So we're faced with a challenge. Making the wrong decision can lead to backup systems and data recovery solutions of greater complexity, higher costs, and reduced reliability. Ensuring business continuity requires simple yet highly resilient systems with efficient replication capabilities to provide a higher level of protection at a lower cost. This requires visibility and education of the most innovative data protection and disaster recovery solutions and how they can tackle the toughest data protection challenges. I recommend learning how leading companies have been increasing availability and reliability with new data protection solutions. For years, the data protection and disaster recovery markets have undergone both evolution and revolution as new products emerge on the scene while others mature and grow. This rapid pace of innovation has resulted in more end-to-end -end choice than ever before. So in today's business landscape, we see companies of all shapes and sizes faced with major weather events, ransomware attacks, and other outages disrupting their business. Data centers are asking themselves, is our current state data protection solution capable of facing these present and future challenges? Well, key stakeholders need to rapidly learn how to assess and improve their data protection through proven, modern, and integrated technology that brings together availability, protection, and insights. The global impact of COVID-19 on all of us, and particularly business, has rightfully caused many to discuss and reevaluate how they interact and work. Like how to recover from a ransomware attack in minutes, not a day, week, or month. Businesses need a no downtime environment. Companies need the right platform for disaster recovery, backup, and their cloud mobility. So in my view, there needs to be a wise business decisioning in the limiting of the impact of interruptions to data, applications, infrastructure with disaster recovery services. See, there's the need to create a disaster recovery plan around the right recovery solution for your business. And with the growth of cloud-based services, businesses need to ensure that mission-critical applications that power their businesses are always available. Any loss of service has a direct impact on the bottom line which makes business continuity planning a critical element to any organization. However, the cost and complexity of legacy disaster recovery solutions has kept many organizations from deploying business continuity solutions. Modern disaster recovery solutions leverage the cloud to help reduce the cost of disaster recovery. Retrofitting an on-premises disaster recovery solution to leverage the cloud doesn't reduce the cost and complexity of managing the on-premises hardware-based solutions. So in conclusion, I believe a purpose-built solution for each of the cloud platforms a customer chooses needs to be designed to be simple, delivering native experience with full application awareness. Data protection through a backup solution that securely protects customer data. All right. Thanks so much, Gareth. Excellent presentation. Very well said. Uh, we do appreciate that. And I've just brought up a poll question for everyone out there, the first of two poll questions before I introduce you to our first presenter. And I mean, we're talking about 
data protection and disaster recovery and uh, disaster recovery as a service. Uh, but so many uh, of these services now leverage cloud in some way to get data off site. And so we're just kind of curious here at Actual Tech Media, and I'm going to share the results of this with you so you can see how you compare with your peers on the event. Where are you in the journey to cloud? Are you 100% all in the cloud today? Do you have most workloads in the cloud, some workloads in the cloud? I bet almost everyone fits in you know, with that uh, category there, that answer there, if you consider software as a service applications. Uh, maybe you ha plan to have workloads in the cloud soon, or you, you have no plans to move any workloads to the cloud. All right, thank you to everyone who responded there to the poll. Let me share the results of this one with you. And it looks like 45% uh, said some workloads in the cloud. Uh, well over 100 people responded to that uh, here in the audience. And followed by, you know, I would say if we combine all, all in the cloud and most in the cloud, that makes up an roughly another 20%. Um, Another 20% roughly plan to have workloads in the cloud soon, and uh, just 12% have no plans at all to move workloads to the cloud today. So very interesting to see. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us on that. A next poll question here, and that is, what's your time frame uh, when it comes to adding new data protection, DRAS, or disaster recovery solutions at your company, or maybe updating, you know, simply what you have. Most of you, I'm sure, have these solutions in place already. So you may be looking for an upgrade or an update. Maybe you have a, a legacy solution you've had for many years that just doesn't perform, it doesn't scale. Maybe you're concerned about the recovery um, speed. You know, if you were hit with a ransomware attack, could you get your data back in, in a, a quick enough time to get all the applications back up and running, you know, uh, RTO, is the RTO going to, to meet your business need? So the question here is what's your time frame for taking some kind of action when it comes to new data protection, DRAS, and disaster recovery solutions? All right, thank you to everyone who responded there to the poll. We do appreciate that. It's now time to kick off the Megacast with our first presenter. I'm excited to welcome Mr. Stacy Budd, Principal Pre-Sales Consultant, as well as Lee Bender, Senior Director for Product Management at ArcServe. Stacy and Lee, take it away. We're glad to be here. Uh, you know, ArcServe and StorageCraft came together. And as we start this, you know, kind of trying to look at it from the perspective that we're bringing two companies, two technologies, two people in the disaster recovery space that have sort of merged together to be able to produce a new solution in the marketplace. Uh, each of us bringing our own uh, kind of best of breed and quality to these things and two markets that were um, that are served from the arc surf side, really serving that mid market and enterprise and the storage craft side. We've been working in this small uh, SMB business as well as working with uh, managed service providers across the, across the globe. Uh, this comprehensive of bringing these two together kind of helped uh, kind of bring these, these things together and that, uh, you know, the priceless uh, assets of bringing these things together for the mid sized enterprise business. Uh, both looking at it from the perspective of, of Arc Service was established in 1983, uh, Storage Curve coming in and being established in 2003, uh, each one of us bringing uh, you know, potentially thousands of clients and now have merged together to be one of the largest data protection companies uh, in the world. So why? Why did they come together? Well, it's one portfolio to perfect and manage all workloads in all environments. Uh, you know, the, broad, the, the breadth of the world and the nature of different types of technologies that are needed. Uh, StorageCraft and ArcServe can now handle that together. So we have this, this data protection and management solution, our fast track innovation and our adaptive business models that allow us to be able to bring these together, uh, giving us certainty and resilience in our solutions. Uh, you get a best of both worlds. You get a best of, a best of breed on both sides of this. Uh, you get new things like uh, disaster recovery as a service on our side. Uh, the StorageCraft world, we get to bring in uh, UDP and different uh, various alliance relationships that ArcServe sort of brought into this to be able to help work with things in security with Sophos as an example. Uh, each one of these bringing our, our own 
our own uh, aspects of this. Uh, we're going to start first with ArcServe UDP, and I'm going to kick it over to Stacy here, and I'm going to let him kind of speak to us about that uh, specifically. Specifically. All right. Th thanks, Lee. Um, appreciate the introduction there. Um, as Lee said, we're going to talk about our unified data protection product. Um, if you want to go ahead and move on to the next slide there, Lee. Um, unified data protection, what is it? It's an image-based backup solution, right? We're doing an on-prem backup of, of virtual environments, physical environments, Windows environments, Linux environments, maybe your Office 365 that's out there, and being able to then take and move that data to another location, another type of stores that's out there. Um, we have some key differentiators within our solution, things like deduplication I'm gonna talk about a little bit here, um, the, and the way specifically that we do that, that make us differentiate away from some of the other um, vendors that are out there in this space. Um, so if you want to go ahead and advance the slide, we'll kind of start diving a little bit deeper into that. I already mentioned kind of the environments that we that we protect, Windows, Linux, physical, virtual. Um, it's an image-based backup solution, right, from, from that perspective. And when we look at that, you know, ArcServe is first and foremost was a software company, right? So you're able to, to leverage your hardware um, your storage for this, and then be able to, to support that from that perspective. Um, we also have built into the product the ability to replicate the data to another location, right? It could be another physical location you have. It could be a cloud location that you have from, from that perspective. Um, we support public cloud, private cloud, our own clouds for, for that as well. Um, and you may have cross-site replication if you had data at both locations um, from that perspective too, right? Our software, and if you go ahead and advance the slide here, um, as well as our appliance line I'm going to speak of to here, um, both include our so um, the Sophos Intercept X Advanced Edition. Um, we view the fact that we are not a security company. Right, we could analyze data, watch it change, and tell you after the fact. Hey, we think you got hit by ransomware, but we're not experts in there. Let, let's face it; we've been in this industry since '83. We do what we do very well, and we lean on partnerships and alliances like Sophos to be able to bring that to you to protect that backup target. Whether it's whether it's your your software that you roll out, whether it's our appliances here that we have to give you that capability to to go in and make sure that that device is locked down and secured from any type of, of ransomware. Because let's face it, in today's world, you know, uh, your backups are going to be the first target for ransomware in most cases uh, when, when we look at that. Uh, when we look also at the at the cloud, right, there's a little bit of a differentiator when we talk about the ArcServe cloud, right? This is a cloud that's hosted by ArcServe. You reach out to ArcServe for, for any help that you need with that or any questions or, or anything like that. So one point of contact for the Sophos that's on here, for the hardware that's on here, for the software, if you're going to cloud, be able to do that as well. So that's what we're bringing to the table is the ability to give you that, that one point point of contact for all of those pieces to the puzzle. And if you add on to this, something that's not on this slide, the um, the, the one safe um, storage product that gives you the ability to do immutable um, snapshots on top of the, these backups, right? It gives you that extra layer. And again, one, one vendor to contact for all of that. If you want to go ahead and advance the, the slides or the slide. There you go. Thank you. So First and foremost, we are a recovery company. It's about getting your data back. How can you get your data back? Okay. Um, first off, being able to any physical systems that you've backed up, being able to to do bare metal restores to dissimilar hardware, um, any virtual systems that you've backed up on VMware Hyper-V or Nutanix AHV, where we can do agentless backups, being able to do um, virtual machine level restores of that. In today's world, we're doing less and less of those virtual machine level restores. And typically what we tend to see is people will sp will stand up the backups in a virtual environment instead using something like Instant VM or virtual standby. So these are two DR options, right? Where we can take and we can spin up those systems and then be able to, people can be accessing those backups in a matter of minutes, 
right? As opposed to waiting to do a restore. And then once you're ready to make that a permanent machine, use a tool like vMotion, or if it was virtual standby, you don't even have to do that, okay? So giving you that those capabilities. We can also have automated, and we do also have automated DR testing within the assured, within the um, UDP product called Assured Recovery. Okay, that would not only tell you, hey, yeah, the machine booted up, but you could have scripts as part of that. So test things like services of applications, different things like that to make sure that that's going to work. All on top of that, of course, being able to do granular file and folder level restores without having to first restore the system, right? So being able to drill down into those backups to find the file in the folder that you want to restore. When we look at the cloud and what we do within the cloud market, right? Number one, I have customers that have, you know, um, deployments out in the cloud and they're backing up that cloud data. We can absolutely do that. It depends on, on how that is and how that's deployed on our level. Definitely something like Office 365 we support, but even workloads that are in the cloud, you know, as long as we can install an agent out there, we can back those up as well. We could also um, back up to the cloud. And that cloud could be public cloud like Amazon or, or uh, uh, Microsoft, right? Their cloud offerings. We support other clouds like Wasabi and things like that as well, S3 compatible. Um, so we can definitely support those as targets too. So where we can copy the data to or replicate depending on the capabilities. Why would you go with the ArcServe cloud? You know, with the ArcServe cloud, we're going to handle that cost of the egress of the data back down for you. So keep that in mind. And again, it's one vendor to contact for, for all of that, right? Um, from that perspective, from a backup perspective, right? What do we do specifically for backups? I hit most of these, right? Physical Windows and Linux, agentless for VMware, Hyper-V, um, Nutanix, AHV, those kind of things. Really, when we start to differentiate ourselves is when we get to the deduplication of the of and how we manage deduplication. The fact that we perform our deduplication beginning at the source. So before it ever hits a network, we've determined what that unique data is. Okay. Now this is going to reduce your, your, your bandwidth utilization, right? So you have better utilization of your bandwidth, right? You're using less bandwidth. And it's also, of course, deduplication and compression is going to help your storage side. Uh, when you look at that, right, that can't be, you know, overlooked in, in most, you know, I know storage is getting cheaper and cheaper, you know, by the day, it seems like sometimes, but still, it's always, if you can make that spend a little bit less, you know, have the software handle it, we don't need to go to really intelligent storage, because we can handle that deduplication within the software side of things. We also work a little bit different with our infinite incremental backups and the fact that we use a merge process as opposed to a synthetic process. So we don't ever have to do a, a synthetic backup, a full backup, which takes time. It takes sometimes disk space, depending on the vendor and within all that as well. So it's much more efficient um, from a speed perspective, the way that it's handling the data and all of that. Your data can be encrypted in motion and at rest which we got quite a few, you know, highly secure type locations that we back up. So that's always going to be, be critical there as well. Lastly, kind of on, on, on the management piece, right? This is where I usually go in and we, we demo this piece, but, you know, one console, whether it's in the cloud, whether it's on-prem, your same kind of experience across the board for that. If you are a customer that, that you know, has certain, you know, security requir requirements and access requirements, we have that role-based administration that we can put in the, in the tool as well. And then we can pull in SLA reporting and things like that too. You want to go ahead and advance to, I think it's my last slide. What, thanks, Lee. When we look at, at kind of 
the deployment of the, of this solution. This slide's a little busy. There's pieces of it that you may not use, right? For instance, you know, if you're not going out to tape, it, you probably aren't going to use the ArcServe backup piece unless you have like a Unix server or something out there that you want to back up. But when you really kind of start to look at this, right? When you look at that primary site that's up on the top right, being able to have that backup server, that RPS server that's that's up there, the ArcServe UDP server, which could be an appliance. Right. Being able to take and back up that local environment, copy it off to other types of media that that, that you know, arc serve backup that could be disk, that could be one safe, that could be, you know, any any number. It could be tape, as we see here that we're going off to from that side of things. Right. Being able to, to do that kind of off site. Um, or off media, offline kind of backup there as well on site. Then once we look at remote offices, I might have either multiple softwares installed. I might have, you know, another um, appliance deployed out there as well, being able to back that up and then send the data to between those two different sites if, if that's what we need to do, back up that environment, or maybe it's just a target to replicate over and give me, you know, uh, uh, another location where I can offsite my data, maybe that location locations, you know, across the country or something like that. When we look at finally, you know, being able to support, you know, going out to cloud, our own cloud, public cloud, different options that are out there from that perspective, we could either have a server installed up there so the data stays encrypted, uh, excuse me, not encrypted, stays deduplicated is what I meant to say, All right? Obviously, if it goes to the ArcServe cloud, it's going to be encrypted as well. Um, and if you turn on encryption, it would be encrypted when it goes up to the uh, to that cloud location too. Okay. Now you don't have to have a server up there. We could do a copy command and copy backups up there instead, right? L leveraging things like you know um, uh, Azure's S3 storage lock, for instance, um, or you know um, go into something like um, Wasabi or something like that as well from, from that perspective. Okay, and then don't forget to go into the ArcServe cloud, right? Giving you that capability where we have our own cloud. You see here on the bottom right, there is a cloud console. That cloud console is exactly the same as the console on your primary site. You may just have a console on the primary site and you manage the remote site from that, from that console, okay? Or you may decide, hey, I want to have two consoles in case I lose my primary site. We give you the flexibility to easily do that. And when you're in one console versus the other console, it's really just an address. Everything else that you do is going to look identical. There's no learning curve, right? Whether or not you're protecting physical, virtual, on-prem, off-prem, right? Once you learn how to use the tool, it's across the board. It supports everything from that perspective. And that's really what I had uh, on the UDP side of things. I look forward to hearing, you know, Lee's um, presentation on disaster recovery. So back to you. Thanks, Stacey. And, you know, that was some really great information here. Um, kicking it and kind of changing gears here for disaster recovery as a service. First off, StorageCraft implemented our DR service um, really primarily out of a couple of needs. One of them was we had... Uh, multiple partners that didn't have a second data center or didn't want to manage a second data center. And so as a result, there was a lot of reasons that kind of this became, you know, but most of it is just some of the challenges that face when having these DR implementations. You know, disaster recovery is a critical part of any business and operation there. And it's interesting is that most uh, applications that are not covered by DR, or what's really interesting about it is some people have um, recognizing the cost and the complexity of having a second data center. And what's really interesting is that they need this, but they can't afford it or they don't want to do it. And the problem is that it creates that half of all those organizations are unlikely to survive if they ever get hit by a disaster. So the problem that happens in disaster recovery is we think about this from a perspective of, well, it's never going to happen. And it never happens until it happens. And that's when the situation when it actually comes into place. And disaster is defined by a variety of different things. Uh, disaster can be a storm, as I'm showing here, or it could be simply something as now the new threat is ransomware and how it hits every day. So born was a storage craft cloud services. These are the components of which we built this on. Uh, essentially with four key pillars here, with purpose-built disaster recovery. When you look at other clouds, such as Google, Amazon, Azure, 
A lot of those clouds specifically are built for infrastructure as a service. They allow you to be able to host data up there, but they're not certainly necessarily built for folks that are actually looking for have data that are on-prem and need to be able to make sure that they can, they can have a redundant place in which to run to. So the DR cloud for StorageCraft was built specifically with the purpose of being able to take image-based backups like UDP, like our StorageCraft products, and be able to make them so we can run them in that cloud. So we actually can transfer them and fail over to the cloud. We made it so it's simple and powerful. We had to try to create a centralized management, make sure that it's flexible and allow for a complete recovery, that we're not just looking at it from the perspective of an individual file or folder or even just a place to store it, but a place that you can actually function and run to. And made it wanted to be secure and reliable. We're using heavy, heavy encryption in some of our, our technologies, military grade, uh, and making sure that make sure that we, we are allowing uh, direct access to it. Now, our cloud and our product and our image-based uh, cloud services all start with a backup. It's all start with an image-based backup. That image-based backup really just starts with snapshot data, dumping it off to any kind of on-prem storage location, which can be the one safe uh, component, which is what uh, Stacey mentioned about, that's our immutable storage. And then taking that snapshot data and then jumping it up to the, up to the cloud. Uh, we support a variety of different operating systems from uh, Microsoft and, Hyper and VMware for hypervisors to Windows servers to various Linux servers, uh, allowing us to be able to make sure that that data as it gets moved can be moved to that cloud. Now, this is a purpose built. It is disaster recovery as a service. And one of the things that we're really proud to talk about is that we have based the service now in Google Cloud Platform. So the infrastructure underneath our cloud, so we are a DR as a service cloud, specifically built for disaster recovery, but it is based off the Google Cloud Platform. So we are built on that now. And it starts with our three products primarily right now, Shadow Protect, Shadow Safe, and One Safe Solo. Each one of them taking those images, those, those various systems. Uh, Particularly our solo is really unique to some of our partners because there's many times that people have maybe one or two locations that are very remote, very um, small, and may not necessarily have any kind of infrastructure of itself. And those devices are designed to be able to let people take data in those locations and send them up to a place like the cloud so they can actually protect remote office or remote uh, facility locations. Now, our cloud is divided by three basic levels, what we call cloud basic, cloud plus, and cloud premium. Each one of them offers their own individual uh, functions and feature set. The first one, cloud basic, is just simply a place that you can actually land data. Uh, sometimes you may not necessarily have a system that needs to be recovered. Uh, some classic file servers is, a, is the best example of it. I need a copy of the data. I need to have it somewhere. We like to mention that we always like to talk about the three, two, one rule, that three copies, two locations, and one of them offsite. Cloud Basic is perfect for that. It allows us to be able to put that data just in some location to us. We also have something called Cloud Plus. Now, Cloud Plus allows us to be able to take that data and actually be a prior use of it. There'll be various scenarios, maybe some manufacturing, some architectural diagrams, some folks that have uh, various components that don't necessarily need to fail to the cloud, but they need to make sure a copy of it. And they need to be able to occasionally retrieve data out of it. Our Cloud Plus is designed specifically for that, to be able to, to recover that data without any kind of egress charges for the recovery of those files. Uh, very slick, very easy to use. Uh, what we're showing here in the slide essentially is the location that we're doing this from and allowing us to be able to take a snapshot that we have up in the cloud based off your image-based data, mounting it and being able to extract that user data from it. Lastly is Cloud Premium. And cloud Premium is one of my favorites, a product that we've had uh, since the very beginning and sort of the inception of this. And this allows us to be able to take any Windows system uh, and a variety of different Linux systems and be able to take that data and send it up to the cloud. And then and on your demand, on your service, no need to contact us. You log into a console and all you have to do is just say launch VM and you can actually launch this VM. We also have an orchestration component of this that allows us to be able to launch them in specific orders. So for example, you have a complex environment with some Active Directory controllers. You want your Active Directory controllers to be up before maybe your SQL servers. We allow you to be able to do that with our orchestration piece and our cloud premium side of it that lets those make sure that those components in Active Directory are up and running, making sure that they can do the authentication for it and then allow us to be able to do the administration on top of it. When you link it all together, it's simply this. You take backup devices, you replicate them to the cloud, and then you're ready for any event. Now, who knows what that event is going to be? But lately, the biggest event that everybody's been talking about is ransomware. And I just want to throw in the benefit of something like cloud services and or disaster recovery as a service. It allows us to be able to take the ability to be able to look at that 
space between the on-premise location and the cloud as that air gap, is that opportunity to make sure that that data cannot be replicated and or copied over because we give you that protection for things like ransomware. Ransomware wants to task and, and try to uh, attack as soon as, it, as everything that it sees in the environment. With an air gap between these locations, they can't do that. And you always will have that data up there. And with the cloud premium side of it, you could launch immediately and be able to run that data and be able to get it up and running in the cloud, being able to give you full recovery in a matter of minutes, as opposed to being able to have to worry about doing full restores from even on-prem locations. So disaster recovery as a service is really kind of that all-encompassing ability to be able to take that data, get it from on-site, to the cloud location, giving you the options to be able to recover from a disaster in any situation. So with that, I'm gonna kind of end it right there and we're gonna kick it over to some questions here. And I did see that one that came in for you, Stacey, I'd like to, to kind of throw towards you. Um, is the UDP appliance expandable? Yeah, that's a great question, Lee. Um, the UDP appliances, we do have two U model units, which, you know, you're not locked into the storage from that perspective. They give you an additional processor, higher level of RAID, but they also give you the ability to add storage to those boxes as well. So um, it, you can add additional drives that you would get through ArcServe, right, from, from that perspective. But you can definitely add to that. You're not, not locked in. And that goes all the way up to 150. 52 terabytes on the box, right? That's pre dedupe, right? Uh, when we look at effective capacity, that's way up above there, right? If you're looking at a three to one kind of ratio with that or better, depending on, on the environment. But great question. One on the storage craft side here, essentially for disaster recovery, is the amount of data that's on a per node basis. So most places you have to worry about for Amazon Azure, you have large charges based on the amount of data. Well, for every node that you set up there, we have a per node charge. And in that node charge, you get a, you get a full terabyte of data with each node. And it is, it is something that you can combine. So think of it this way. I have 10 servers that need to be protected up in the cloud. Maybe I have two of them that are above a terabyte, but the rest of them are fairly small. Maybe, maybe 200 gig, which is kind of your average size of a, ter of a, of a server. You take a look at it and say, oh, with 10 servers, I have 10 terabytes of storage space of which I'm not charged for and allows us to be able to take that data and be able to, uh, to use it and, and occupy the amount of space. Uh, accordingly, you have, you have the full amount of space available for 10 terabytes where you maybe only are occupying maybe three or four terabytes as necessary for that particular group of servers. Uh, it's very nice and cumulative. Uh, on top of that, the other question we often get is, can I test this? You know, can I go through a regular test plan? And you know, that's a funny thing is, is that most people don't test their DR plans, but we built the storage craft service to allow you to be able to have 30 days of free testing and be able to try that out, be able to, to go through a disaster recovery plan and be able to confirm that everything is working properly up in that cloud to be able to make sure you can access to it either through VPN or through other method methodology. Hey, I think we're out of time. Uh, our last call to action for you is if you like what you see, please reach out to us. We're, we're here to help. We try to be able to make sure that we can build the right solution for you. Go to arcserve.com or storagecraft.com and either one of them will be able to get you to the solutions that you've heard about today. And with that, James, I'm going to kick it back to you. All right, excellent presentation. Thanks so much, Lee and Stacy. Uh, really cool to learn about uh, the ArcServe and StorageCraft solution. Uh, congratulations on the, the new merging of the two companies, merging of the solutions to become even more powerful. Um, I've just brought up a poll question that says, what additional information would you like about the ArcServe solution? And I encourage everyone to respond to that. We do want your feedback. ArcServe wants to hear your feedback on this. So I'll leave that up while I announce our first Amazon $500 gift card. Our first of 10 gift cards today. This one's going out to Tim Duber, I believe is how you pronounce it. Tim Duber from Ohio. Congratulations, Tim Duber from Ohio. We'll reach out to deliver your Amazon $500 gift card via email after the event. All right. If anyone hasn't responded to the poll yet, we do appreciate your feedback still. I'll give you another moment to respond to that. All right. Thank you to everyone who responded to the poll. Let's go ahead and keep the megacast moving. We've got a lot more to learn about still today. And with that, it's time to move on to our next presentation.
I'm excited now to introduce Andrew Lorandos, Principal Solutions Engineer, and David Perez, Senior Product Expert, both from Progress Software. Andrew and David, take it away. Thanks for that introduction. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm excited to walk you through what a day in the life of a file looks like and what kinds of things can happen in that day. We're going to touch on a number of different aspects of file creation, including storage, security, file handling, and I hope you'll find it informative and valuable. Uh, let's jump in. So what happens in the day of a life of a file? Well, on any given day, a lot can happen. Usually it includes something like this. The file is created and it's you know not just any garbage file. We're actually storing valuable information that we're gonna need later and that's so valuable it's worth protecting. And that means layers of security are applied, um, sometimes with varying degrees of success. There's probably going to be threats uh, throughout the day. Um, the security that we've applied will be tried and tested. Files get moved all the time and we can't always predict when that happens. Sometimes it happens very predictably. So we need to take into account uh, what we expect to happen for our file in terms of file movement. And of course, ultimately, a file could be retired. And we want to be able to look back and the aftermath of all this activity and ask, was that supposed to happen? And be able to uh, look at the audit trail and just get a really good understanding uh, of what happened, both from the perspective of IT governance um, and from the perspective of, you know, uh, managing your workflows better. Um, I mentioned file value. Um, that value is really built on a lot of different things. It can be the context. It can be, you know, who is producing or using the file, who's maintaining the files, uh, whether the content is uh, required in terms of compliance, you know, legally mandated, um, to be uh, maintained properly or in a certain way. And that means that you know, where there's value, there's also a risk that we're not going to take care of that file as it deserves to be take, taken care of or needs to be taken care of. And so we're gonna balance uh, the amount of risk that we're willing to take on against the value. And ideally, we're going to minimize the risk uh, to the fullest extent possible or completely eliminate it. Um, in terms of file protection, that means we're gonna look at things like the location, where it's stored, where it's going to be stored, um, the awareness, who knows about this file, and do the people who need to know about the file's existence uh, know about it? Uh, is there proper authorization being required to access and use the file? And of course, something that is often overlooked, encryption. Are we encrypting the data when we send a file from one place to another? And uh, also, as importantly, are we encrypting that data at rest? All uh, key things to consider in protecting a file. We talked about file threats. Well, who's coming for you? Where are these threats um, in relation to your file? Well, they could be internal to your environment. They can include compromised users or contractors, maybe third parties. There could be accidental misuse or disclosure. Never seen that happen personally. Nope, just kidding. I've seen it all the time. Partners, uh, joint ventures with lax file security uh, may have access to your files internally, and that can pose a risk. Uh, there can also be service providers or system application vendors that don't have the same security standards as you, but are privy to some of your most sensitive data. Externally, we're looking at things like phishing, spear phishing, whaling, um, malware, ransomware. Um, uh, DDoS attacks, where we're losing the ability to distribute or access the, that data altogether. Advanced persistent threats, botnet attacks, malicious macros and scripts. Getting a handle on all of these things together will help us quantify the risk that's associated with our files because they can have a huge impact to our business or organization in terms of how our workflows are carried out, uh, whether there will be fines that we have to pay for failing to meet. Uh, compliance requirements, or even potential liability uh, where uh, users or owners of data are concerned. So let's try to look at this holistically um, as a whole life cycle in a day. Uh, where do we start? We usually, the new file creation, someone's got a great idea, they take something really valuable and they store it 
um, in you know, a given location. And that could be in, in one particular space. It could be in multiple places, um, either locally, like on-prem, uh, in the cloud, or maybe across uh, those different domains in, in a hybrid environment. It could be that those files require compliance with regulatory standards like HIPAA or PCI DSS or GDPR, which is frequently the case and is uh, often uh, something that comes up when there's a lot of value attached to the data in files. Of course, files get shared with other parties. They get backed up and not necessarily to the locations that um, they live in when they're initially stored. Um, they're probably going to reach one or more mobile endpoints, and they could be on uh, devices internal or external to your organization. Um, look at everything we've covered so far. All that could go undergo an audit for data security and compliance throughout each of these steps. Uh, the state of file security will eventually be reviewed by an executive or by stakeholders, and honestly, those kinds of reviews could happen at any time, especially when an IT organization is very conscientious about um, caring for the life cycle of their data. And, you know, we want to make sure that we've got IT governance measures that make sure the whole process is effective. Threats can be present at almost any point in this process. And what we want to do is get a handle on uh, how we can manage our risk and reduce it or eliminate it particularly by looking at um, the security of file as it's moving from one place to another and at those places where it's stored and make sure that we know um, what's been going on with our files. So given all the things that can happen to a file throughout its life cycle in any given day, how do we win the day? Well, there's certain aspects of the file security and management that are most frequently overlooked. And these include establishing an automated centrally managed workflow for secure file sharing, ensuring data is encrypted both at rest and in transit, which is not something that every file transfer application can do. We need to be sure we're capturing an evergreen audit trail to measure security effectiveness. And I was recently asked, what does it mean evergreen? Well, in this context, it means that we have an auditable log that is always up to date, that we can refer to at any point to understand where the file's been and what state it's in right now. And we also need to provide a unified approach to secure file transfers when we need to meet strong compliance standards like HIPAA or PCI DSS or others. And all these things can be met with a single solution that we refer to as a managed file transfer solution. So why are we talking about managed file transfer? Well, we happen to be uh, some experts in this area. Um, Progress uh, provides an outstanding managed file transfer option in its Move It uh, secure uh, transfer application. Thousands of organizations rely on Move It uh, for their secure compliant data transfer. And uh, it offers that secure control between uh, uh, users, different locations, partners, person to person, system to system. And we're able to automate the workflow so that um, a lot of the difficulties that you would see happen in that life cycle of a file throughout the day uh, that normally come up because of human error or because um, there's too much human glue holding your workflow together. Um, those risks can be reduced or eliminated with the help of automation that MoveIt can provide. So I'd like to introduce uh, Progress MoveIt in terms of the different components that make up the whole managed file transfer suite. It all starts with MoveIt Transfer, which is the secure file transfer server. And on that, we can add MoveIt Automation to help uh, implement that uh, workflow automation that I mentioned before and uh, help alleviate some of the difficulties that uh, occur due to human error when there's too much you know uh, human glue holding your workflow process together automation can definitely reduce or eliminate that risk uh, move a gateway where you want to have a dmz resident reverse proxy and keep the managed file transfer solution outside of your uh, secure uh, network 
but still accessible to your users. And last of all, we offer Move It Cloud, which is our managed file transfer as a service that Progress manages for you and delivers all of the goodness that um, you would get in Move It Transfer as a service. So I've given you a good overview of why we would care about managed file transfer and what Move It is. I'd like to take a few minutes now to uh, turn the time over to Andrew so he can actually uh, give you a demonstration of Move It and you can see it for yourself. Perfect, thanks David. Yeah, so today I'd like to specifically walk us through the Move It automation component of the overall Move It solution. And really what Move It automation is about is going to be able to consolidate many of our dispersed automated processes, whether that is going to be actually scripting these processes out or individuals moving files around as they're being created. Uh, a really good example of that is if we are maybe receiving files from an external party and need to deliver those internally to a process that is ultimately going to consume those files, or if it's something that's being generated internally, maybe needs to be routed to another service internally or delivered to an external trading partner. So how we go about doing that in Move It Automation is first and foremost, we would define our endpoints. And this is going to be sources, destinations for these files. So various systems within the ecosystem or external. Once we've done that, we really just walk through a very simple process through the web interface to actually define what would our workflow look like. So that would entail what server are these files coming from. Here we would just add a step, add source and destination as needed. Once we've done that, we can go ahead and specify things like file masks, et cetera. But this allows us to determine which files should we be picking up uh, and ultimately what processes need to be run against them. Now, as far as processes are concerned, it could be something as simple as zip or unzip or a PGP encrypt or decrypt prior to sending these files to destination. Uh, but you could actually build this out to have custom scripts as well. So if you have maybe some more complex business logic that needs to occur as part of these transactions, that's definitely not a problem. Uh, you would be able to create that using a PowerShell script, for example, and uh, facilitate those processes. Now, once we pick that file up, Move It Automation just sort of logically walks through our process here. And that would be sending it out to our processing location. In this case, it's localhost, but uh, as you can imagine, that could be any of those sources or destinations. And in this case, we also have an archive location. So to David's point earlier, a lot of the time these files are being stored out in various locations. Uh, maybe they're never actually being removed from the source location, and we have many years of data sitting out there that we don't necessarily need. Automation is really going to help us limit the scope of what data is at rest on any system at any given point in time because we can actively monitor these sources for these files. And of course, once we process them, in the event that we have to go through uh, reprocessing of this file, we're going to have a really easy way to determine where did this file ultimately wind up going. In this case, we're actually uh, prepending the date timestamp using some macros here but that will indicate when did we actually process this file on disk, at least. Now, of course, this is the actual file flow, but we need to determine when should this process run as well. So every process in Move It Automation or task would have its own dedicated schedule. So we can really get away from relying on things like Windows Task Scheduler or a cron job or things like that and nail down exactly when should these processes run. In this case, it's seven days a week. But automation does actually have a very helpful function where we can run when files arrive between specific time frames. And that could be 24 hours a day uh, if we're monitoring for this. But we could also tailor this based on SLAs. So if we have an SLA that a file needs to be delivered every day by 5 p.m., and for whatever reason that file is not generated, not delivered, automation can actually trigger email alerts to go out to the relevant parties to let them know something went wrong. Uh, we maybe need to go in and 
take a look at what happened with that process. And that's more of a proactive alert as opposed to getting a message a week later saying, you know, something that file didn't get generated. We need to take a look at what happened. So being more proactive lets the business line know, lets it the move it automation administrators and administrators know uh, something went wrong. We need to figure out what happened. Now, configuring the email, of course, we can send that out to uh, many individuals. This, again, is a per task notification. So each workflow may have different notification requirements. But we can include a lot of information here. Uh, one of the really helpful ones is a full error description, which would include things like uh, maybe a, a server timeout occurred. We, we weren't able to connect to that system. It's down. Uh, so we can include that in here very easily. Uh, quite a few built-in macros or variables that we could use there. So with that being said, normally this would just run on its schedule. Um, we would have our scheduler enabled. It would go ahead and process these as they're coming in. Now, when that occurs, we can actually see running processes out on our task list. So uh, we would see where it is in the process, what, uh, what step is it on effectively. But once it's complete, we can now come in and see when it last ran. So in this case, uh, July 15th, what was the result and how many files were sent. Now, that's really good. Uh, it's going to give us the last task run. It's kind of a, a good snapshot. But in the event that we have uh, a processing occur maybe on June 30th, and we need to determine what files were actually transmitted during that time, where did they wind up going? With Move It Automation, we actually have the capability of viewing the run history for a particular task. So we can filter down specifically to that. And we can go into, here's our, our June 30th process. Uh, we can drill down into the file activity for that particular task run. So if we drill down into that, we can now see a list of all of the files that we've processed. And maybe we're looking for a, a very specific file. Could maybe do a little bit better job filtering, but uh, we're looking for this move it transfer underscore 80 file. And we can see that we picked it up. We ran a process against it, which uh, in this case was a PGP encrypt. We sent it out to our processing location and our archive location. I mentioned earlier, we may have a, a scenario where we need to go through and reprocess that file. We need to deliver to the business line, where is that file in the archive location? How do we determine that? Well, in today's world, we may not be able to, uh, or it's gonna take a lot of digging. But with automation, we can actually just come in, pull out that full uh, destination path, including the rename, uh, because we were uh, uh, prepending the date timestamp here. So pulling out that specific files, um, effectively snapshot of when we processed it uh, with that archive location and being able to run it through again or uh, maybe do some data validation against it at that point, uh, whatever the case might be, we can make it pretty simple to do so. Now, I will quickly mention uh, so that is what we would consider a traditional task, pretty linear. You know, we, we walk through each step. I mentioned earlier as well that there are some scenarios where we maybe have some more complex business logic. We might need to do scripting. There are also advanced tasks. So we can introduce more complex business logic or uh, conditional logic into these processes. So in the event that we are scripting this out or it is a manual process that has a few uh, logic steps involved, automation can handle those pretty well uh, as well. So we can go in to find if it meets certain criteria, we're going to run different processes against it. Uh, if in this case it's a zip, we're gonna unzip it and send it out. And you can build this out to handle some pretty complex logic. So, but otherwise that's, that's really a high level overview of Move It. Uh, of course, in your environment, you're going to have pretty specific use cases. We would be more than happy to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation as far as what those are and uh, how they would translate into Move It as well. Andrew, thanks for that. That was a fantastic demo, and I really appreciate you walking us through that. Uh, we have some questions that have popped up, and 
I would love your help answering some of these. Let's see. The first question is how many people does it take to manage an MFT application like Move It? And you know, just at the outset, I would say uh, you know, once you get this properly integrated into your environment, this is something that one person could easily manage on an ongoing basis. But you know, best practice would be always have you know um, several layers of competency within your organization. So if someone needs to go on vacation. Of course, you can you know continue to uh, maintain that uh, without a hiccup. Um, I understand that as far as implementing it, uh, move it is something that you know with uh, you know proper planning you could easily implement in a day and you know start realizing value right away. Great question. Um, next question. Uh, do you have some examples of companies that are using an MFT successfully? Yes, we do. Um, lots of case studies are available at um, progress.com. Uh, we have case studies, news cases organized by industry, including banking and finance, uh, education, government, healthcare, retail, and the list goes on. Um, very recently, uh, we worked with uh, Milwaukee County to understand. Uh, how they used MoveIt to, uh, you know, create some discipline around their file transfer and actually realize, you know, some bottom line savings in doing so. So I'd encourage you to go check those out. And you know, if you're looking for a specific uh, use case or you know industry relevant uh, case study, and you're not finding it, you know, uh, shout out to us, and we'll be happy to uh, look into that with you. Great. Another question, uh, and Andrew, maybe I could get your help with this. Does Move It meet HIPAA, PCI, or other compliance standards? And here, yeah, I'd say we're essential, but not sufficient typically when it comes to meeting those kinds of uh, compliance standards because they're fairly complex. But Andrew, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So as far as compliance standards are concerned, uh, some of the big ones that we would typically talk about would be HIPAA, PCI, uh, but we could potentially be talking about DFARS, ITAR, things like that. Mm -hmm. And the answer is ultimately that MoveIt is definitely a um, helpful component to that solution. We provide all the tools to be compliant. However, as a deployed solution, there's never really a uh, clear-cut way to say that, yes, this is going to be compliant. So there would definitely be some due diligence as far as ensuring that the environment meets those standards. One thing that is very helpful in regards to that, though, is, as David mentioned earlier, that Move It Cloud instance, because it is a managed instance, uh, we actually go through, uh, our dedicated cloud operations team goes through a third-party independent audit for both HIPAA and PCI. So if you are transmitting that data, uh, we can provide AOCs, um, potentially a BAA in, in case of HIPAA, things like that. So we can definitely help you get there, I think is the, the best answer. Yeah, excellent. So thanks for that. And um, it looks like that may be all the questions we have for now, but uh, if you have additional questions, by all means, uh, feel free to send them our way. Um, you can contact Andrew directly. His email address is here, and um, you can also reach out to our sales team. Uh, we have experts who can help answer uh, virtually every question you have about MoveIt and manage file transfer. And if you're interested in getting a trial for yourself, uh, by all means, uh, let us help you get that set up and uh, see what MoveIt can do uh, for you and your organization. Thanks for joining us today. All right, thank you so much, Andrew and David. Really cool presentation. Thank you for uh, educating us on what uh, MoveIt can do and has done for so many different companies out there. I've just brought up our next poll question that says, what additional information would you like about Progress Software? Specifically, we're talking about MoveIt here. And I'll leave that up while I announce our next prize winner. We've got an Amazon $500 gift card. This is going out to Deborah Weinstein from Maryland. Congratulations, Deborah Weinstein from Maryland. 
And our first grand prize, this is for a 3D printer, going to Chris Trasky from Illinois. Congratulations to all of the prize winners. Uh, more 3D printers, more gift cards still on the way. Uh, thank you to everyone who, who submitted questions here. Uh, we are uh, routing those over to Andrew and David, and those help, of course, to enter you into our best question prize drawing as well. All right, thank you to everyone who responded there to the poll. Let's go ahead and keep the mega cast moving. It's now time for our next presentation. I'm excited to introduce Mr. David Huskisson, Rapid Restore Solutions Manager, and Mr. Mark Mogam Burkett, Senior Product Marketing Manager for Flashblade, both at Pure Storage. David and Mark, it's great to have you on. Take it away. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Mark Mauberkett, and I'm here with David Huskinson from Pure Storage. Uh, today, we're going to be taking a look at the changing world of data protection. With lots of changes happening on a daily basis, we are seeing that what was once even true a few months ago is now changing. So I'm going to begin with a bold statement. Backup doesn't matter anymore. Uh, you may be asking, why is that? Uh, I thought that, you know, we have more systems and more data all over the place, so backups are, would be even more important. So let me break that down a little bit. Uh, in today's world, we see backup capabilities everywhere. They're built into applications, they're in OSs, they're in, built into storage, they're built into cloud. Uh, lots of choices on how to protect that data. Uh, these solutions are pretty advanced. Uh, and that many times they're even automated and, or smart. And they're now easy to use. You don't have to be a rocket scientist like you had to, you know, just 20 years ago. When I first started the industry, we had to educate the entire market on why backups were important. But today, everyone knows that. Everyone knows that you need backups. So why aren't backups important anymore? Because now it's all about the recovery. Why is that? Well, we have growing volumes of data that we can't live without. Uh, businesses can't survive without their data. And they expect that when an outage occurs, that they're back online uh, near instantaneously. Uh, no more time, no more uh, weeks or months of restore time is acceptable for a business. Everyone wants to be back within an hour or less. And now there's something else out there. There's something called ransomware that we're all susceptible to. And it's forcing us to start thinking about recovery in different ways. We're, we're having to start to think about large scale recoveries, things that we never had to worry about in the past. So ransomware is everywhere. It's hitting large and small organizations. It's, it's crippling the entire business world uh, and actually even our infrastructure world. Um, entire industries are susceptible to this. Uh, it's so pervasive now that analy analysts are calling out that it's not a matter of if you get hit, it's a matter of when. So what does this have to do with backup and recovery and data protection? Uh, we do backups to be able to recover from outages. Uh, in the past, it usually meant maybe a few files, some folders, Maybe in some cases, uh, you know, a few servers. But now when ransomware hits and encrypts an entire data center, we need to recover the whole lot and do it in hours, not days, weeks, or months. So think about that. Your recovery scale now is your limiting factor on recovering from ransomware. So I want to challenge the audience to think this through. How long is it going to take you just to recover your critical data, the, the data that your, your business or organization can't operate without? Think about that. Is that going to take minutes, hours, days, weeks, months? Now think about your applications and all the patches that go along with it. How long is it going to take to recover those? And what about your infrastructure, your active directories, your networking paths? And what about everything else? So think about your recovery in terms of how how quickly I can get back to 
different states. And I, I just want to bring up one case, in, uh, case point to illustrate. So we all know about Colonial Pipeline. But in the end, uh, what we discovered was that Colonial allegedly paid their ransom after they discovered that recovering from their backups would actually take weeks to months, if not longer. So think about that. In, in the case of Colonial, it made more sense to buy the decryption key from the, the hackers than it did to recover from their uh, backups. So what, what do you need in order to be successful in, in your recoveries looking forward. You want to look at um, your critical business successes and figure out what's important. How do we, how do we get back to an operation state? We want to be able to mount some of our backups and get instant restores and have these mounts be available uh, to the application. So you need high IOPS to actually run off of those backups. Think of your databases. We want, we want it back now. We want it to be able to operate as fluidly as possible. Spinning disk may, may, may not be the best storage to host an instant recovery database. And of course, we all want it fast. This needs to happen in seconds, minutes, uh, hours, not days, weeks, or months. So think about your back end and, and really where's the weakest spot? What's going to hold you from being able to restore everything? So we've talked about the need for large, fast recoveries and how critical it is for organizations to be able to recover from a massive outage. Now, let's talk about your existing infrastructure and, and kind of why those pieces won't necessarily help you achieve the, your new goals. Uh, a lot of existing infrastructure was built with a single uh, purpose in mind, a one-trick pony. Uh, so when you want it fast and instant recoveries, uh, we find a lot of failures in the market. Um, we see a lot of workloads today are, are next-gen and require uh, data and IOPS that existing infrastructure is going to struggle to, to meet. Uh, we also see, you know, with existing infrastructure, they get a check minus for, for sharing and reuse. So when you want to restore and recovery, having a system that doesn't like to share can bind up everything else. And of course, we see the old guard wasn't too good at using all the capacity uh, for storage and compute. So this left silos of operation across the data center, which is a poor use of money and a poor use of uh, resources, especially when you're thinking about a recovery. So pure storage has taken all these factors in, into account, and we have actually come up with a, uh, a unique proposition to help uh, this, this changing data protection market. Um, so first of all, Pure Storage uh, produces a product called FlashBlade, and it's one of the fastest storage platforms in the market today. It's all Flash with an expertise in data protection. And some of you might be scratching your head thinking, data protection on flash you got to be kidding me we are not data protection loves flash our flash blade storage is the industry uh, uses the industry leading unified fast file and object storage platform engineered from the ground up for flash to deliver the simplicity and multi-dimensional performance that enables consolidation of key unstructured data workloads it is a platform for all your unstructured modern data and will power your most uh, demanding modern applications, including data protection. So let's kind of, let's compare the old approach to the new. Uh, with existing infrastructure, you've got, uh, we've created these silos. It's complicated and difficult to manage. You can't deliver the restore capabilities for today's business environments. It's inefficient. And it's slow because they uh, use a, a myriad of older technologies like spinning disk, which is going to slow down your uh, recovery. Um, when you want to be back online as quickly as possible after an attack, like a ransomware attack, you need something different. So Flashblade delivers a digital breakthrough in the transformation of your data center. Um, you get the simplicity, the consolidation and performance for all your unstructured data. 
we deliver a flash storage backend with high IOPS for restores and mounts, fast file and object system restores. Uh, it's easy to manage. Uh, and it can actually be reused with different workloads. So when your system's not uh, at work doing backups, uh, you can actually use the FlashBlade backend to, to run another workload. Um, so you get maximum um, return on your investment. Now, I'm going to hand this off to David, who's going to take us through one of our next gen data protection solutions that we jointly engineered with uh, Pure and Coicity. Uh, and talk about how it can help in, in these um, transformational recovery situations. Okay, thanks, Mark. So Flash Recover really brings together two market leaders, Pure Storage and Cohesity, where we've built a jointly integrated data protection offering. And it consists of Cohesity data protection nodes plus Flash Blade to provide this high performance rapid restore platform. And, you know, it's got a set of use cases that Mark has, Mark has talked about. So, you know, recovery is now key, but also think about recovery from a ransomware, uh, ransomware attack. So let's dig in. Let's dig in a little bit more into the into the architecture here. So as well as it's all flash architecture, uh, which delivers, you know, truly amazing uh, recovery performance. And I'll talk I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And we've got some benchmark, uh, some benchmarking we did in our solutions lab around the restore performance. What's also important is flash recover is a true modern application developed from the ground up. So just think around, you know, non disrupt disruptive upgrades. If you've got a data protection environment and you need to go and upgrade, you know, clients or server applications, you have to plan a lot of outages and a lot of downtime, which is pretty risky. In the flash recover world, because it's all modern, it's a modern application, we've got a full set of non-disruptive upgrades. Really the same with high availability. So we don't, there's plenty of redundancy built into Flash Recover as a data protection application. So, you know, if a component fails, if you have a storage blade failure or one of the Cohesity data protection node as a hardware failure, backups and restores can continue without uh, without disruption and again that's a challenge that you know other other older backup products uh you know will will, will struggle to meet without complicated uh design uh, architectures the thing i really wanted to zero in on here is this concept of the disaggregated uh architecture and you know one of one of data protection's fundamental challenges over the last sort of 15, 20 years, and with data growth, it's becoming more and more of a challenge, is how do I keep my data protection solution scaled to keep up with the ever increasing demands of primary storage? We've all seen primary storage get out of control. It continues to accelerate, you know, with digital transformation and the current environment, there's a lot more businesses storing a lot more data. And so, you know, traditional backup products, you know, have a real challenge here because it's largely adding silos of storage and servers, which isn't great from a management risk deployment perspective and also delivers, you know, reduces uh, your, your overall data protection efficiency because you're deduping backup data within pools of storage rather than across the entire, uh, you know, the, across the entire environment. So this is the real strength of Flash Recover. Because of the Coesity Data Protect nodes and Flash Blade, we've been able to build this di disaggregation of storage and compute. And it's really simple to understand. So 
if you want more power, if you want to improve your restore performance, you can just add additional Cohesity Data Protect nodes. If you need more storage, you can just add additional blades to flash blade in 56 terabyte steps. And you can you can add these both, you can add one without the other. So you can see that this configuration, this architecture can keep pace with your growth of front end data because I can keep a single pool of storage and compute and I can have deduplication across all of them. There's no silos, no little islands of storage and compute running backup software no longer. So it means management is a lot easier. It's a single point of management. I get performance, scale, backup speed and recovery speeds. And it also makes my upgrades and HA capabilities a lot simpler. And that's really the core strength of Flash Recover, this disaggregated compute and storage data protection product. So for the for the final half of the presentation here, I'm just going to share with you some of the performance testing that we've done in our we've done in our solutions lab with Flash Recover because we really wanted to you know really sort of show a couple of things really. We wanted to be able to push you know Flash Recover not quite to its limits, but we really wanted to push it pretty hard with you know real world uh, use cases, and we also wanted to show uh, how, you know the linearity of scale with Flash Recover. You know, as I just talked about in the disaggregation slide, that ability to linearly scale is really important because your primary storage is always growing. So we have to build a an architecture that can keep pace with it. So hopefully you'll see in the next couple of slides that some of the performance testing we did kind of kind of demonstrates uh, you know both of those uh, aspects. So let's start with um, let's start with uh, benchmark number one here. And if I look at benchmark number one, benchmark number one was really around. Uh, you can see the numbers on the slide here, but was really around showing rapid recovery of you know full virtual machines back to the primary source in this case we used our we use pure's uh flash array and you know you can see the numbers here you know uh we were able to recover sort of 8.5 gigabytes a, a, a second but the real you know the real emphasis here is this was over a thousand virtual machines with a single restore policy so again it's pretty much as you know it was really one click back up to protect my whole 1000 VMs and then it was literally one click restore so you really get levels of simplicity here and this was in a eight node um, cohesity data protect cluster with a flash blade so you can see you know you can see really good performance numbers here but what's really interesting is if you then if we then move to the second test that we did which was really you know designed to show you know, this sort of mass restore. So potentially something you would need to do, you know, in a in a ransomware recovery situation. So where I've got petabytes of data that I have to bring back. And what we did is we move, we increased the number of cohesity data protect nodes from eight to 12. And you can see it was it was a more of a data test, but you can see here that you know we were getting thirteen gigabytes a second. So you know with with uh, eight nodes we were at about eight eight and something gigabytes a second. Then when we increase the number of nodes, we're up and around the sort of you know thirteen gigabytes a second level. So that shows that sort of linear scaling. And at this at this level, you know we were able to recover. We ran consecutive. Uh, you know, we ran consecutive backups and sorry, we ran consecutive restores. And again, to be very clear, and the links of the white paper will be available for you to get the more detail. But to be very clear, this time was elapsed time from the start of the to the moment we press start restore to the moment it completed. So obviously the bulk of that is actually data being written back to the to the source, back to the flash array. 
but either side there's some pre-processing and there's you know there's sort of there's a job cleanup uh, phase at the end so that's obviously dead time so you can see all the graphs in the white paper that the point of the test is is that this was complete end to end so we literally started the timer the moment we press restore and we stop the timer when the when when the job had reported back to the ui it was complete so even though this was in a lab hopefully you get a sense of the the, the actual performance out of the box with both tests but also that ability to literally scale. You know, as I said, in the first benchmark, we had eight Coecity data protect nodes and a, and a flash blade. And in the second benchmark, we increased the number of data protect nodes to 12. And you can see that performance goes up quite nicely. But as I say, you can read all the detail in, in the white papers that we'll be sharing. So as we start to wrap things up for, for today, you know, David and I wanted to really just hit home some of the things that you need to start asking yourself about your, your current solution that you're using for, for recovery and whether or not it will be able to withstand the, the, the test uh, against ransomware. So, you know, the number one question that we, we tell all customers is think about what it's going to take to get back your, your critical systems. How long, how long can you be without them and how long is it acceptable to uh, wait until your critical systems are back on? And I think one of my observations there is, Mark, there are, you know, there's a lot of organizations that don't understand what their critical systems are. So it's certainly a good idea to do some kind of audit or investigation into what your fundamental critical systems are. Great. You know, and, you know, to follow up on that, you know, once you get through your critical systems, you really not need to start thinking about everything else that's in your organization. And that audit will absolutely help in identifying what you have, because a lot of uh, organizations today don't realize what type of data they have, how much they have, or uh, how it's being stored across the entire organization. Yeah, and, 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 you know, be be a little bit wary because there's definitely, I think, one of the changing pieces of IT is it, it's very hard for people to delineate between critical and non-critical because I think we all have a perception um, that everything is critical. I mean, think about, you know, you come home and you put Netflix on and you can't watch your Netflix show isn't available. Now, that's not really critical, but I think there's a I think there's this perception or this need that we've taken from our home lives into our work lives that everything is critical. Great. So another point that we want to throw out there is think about your current infrastructure and, and how it's structured. Now, think about whether or not that would be able to um, do a mass recovery if you did get hit with ransomware. And, and again, if you look at the way that backup architectures are designed today, they're not necessarily designed, as Mark said, to, to, with this view to mass recovery. It's like, you know, I, I'm probably ever only going to ever recover two or three databases and a handful of virtual machines. So you have to sort of stress test your current environment to see whether actually it could restore those 50 or 60 or those 5,000 critical virtual machines. You know, and, and then I think the last point that, you know, that we used to call it a resume generating event, but, you know, what are the expectations of your leadership and your organization, you know, when an outage occurs, are they expecting it to be instantly on or is, you know, a week or a month okay? Uh, probably not, but uh, you don't want to get caught, um, you know, in the lurch uh, and, and having uh, to send out resumes because you can't achieve what the, uh, the management team is expecting in terms of recovery. And again, I think, I think the good news story for this audience here is that, you know, ransomware you know prevention detection but also recovery from is you know one of the top you know three or four items of constant discussion in the c-suite so i think uh, you know to mark's point you know making sure you've got alignment with your leadership is important but i think you know just for once 
data protection and especially ransomware recovery is very high up, you know, on a, in, in the CXO universe. So they should be easier conversations today than they perhaps were were sort of 15 years ago. So with that, we just want to leave you with one last thought. Uh, and, and I know that it, it's probably something that's, that's kind of new thinking, uh, but, you know, hopefully after today, hearing about um, mass recoveries and the performance that we see with Flash, you'll realize that data protection loves Flash. Um, you know, Flash delivers uh, unique capabilities that uh, the backup industry has not seen before. So, you know, when you're thinking about how to be able to re, uh, remediate and, and mitigate uh, a ransomware attack, think about putting it on Flash because of the added uh, value and performance there. Um, you're you're going to be in good hands. And with that, David and I would like to thank everyone for uh, attending our, our quick little summary about uh, remediation and recovery and Flash and backup and all the good stuff that goes into data protection today. We talked about our testing uh, data. Uh, at the bottom of this page, you'll find uh, a link to our white paper, which will detail you know, our results in a lot more detail. Uh, and with that, we wanna thank you. Thanks. Great presentation, David and Mark. Really appreciate that. I've just brought up a poll question for everyone out there that says, what additional information would you like about the pure storage solution? And I'll leave that up while I announce our next prize winner. David and Mark are in the chat electronically uh, continuing to answer your questions. So keep those questions coming. I see a lot of great questions coming in. We do appreciate those, as does the pure storage team. So uh, while you answer the poll question out there on your screen in the slides window, I will now announce our next Amazon $500 gift card winner. This is going out to Jason Pierce from Oregon. Congratulations, Jason Pierce from Oregon. Still looks like seven more gift cards to give out, three more 3D printer grand prizes. Uh, so make sure that you stay tuned for those. Also, don't forget about the handouts tab. It's there that you'll find a link to purestorage.com. Uh, you can go to their website. Uh, right there on the top is a link to uh, get the ransomware fast recovery survival kit and you know, check out uh, more resources and information on the importance of recovery, uh, not just backup, but recovery and rapid recovery. I even uh, instant recovery, as, as Craig said out there in the questions pane. So thank you for everyone's comments and questions and for answering the poll. And with that, it's time now to move on to our next presentation. I'm excited now to bring in Mr. Andy Fernandez, Senior Product Marketing Manager at Zerto, and Mr. Everett Berger, Solutions Architect at Tierpoint. Andy and Everett, are you there? Yes. Yep. Can you hear me? We can, yeah. Thanks for being on. Take it away. All right, perfect, thank you. First of all, welcome everybody to this session. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for your time. Uh, the name of the session is actually simple, Recovering from Ransomware. My name's Andy Fernandez. I'm a Senior Manager of Product Marketing here at Zerta. And I'm Everett Berger, uh, Solutions Architect at Tierpoint. Perfect, thank you. And I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'm not gonna set up too much discussion here around what is ransomware, what's going on. I think. Everyone in this audience understand, understands exactly what this threat looks like, what we're facing. Uh, and, and we've seen some very interesting research just in the, in the last year, some of the changes, right, around what are, what are these ransomware attacks causing within the marketplace. And, you know, based on the last year, we've seen a growth in the, both the volume and the severity of these attacks. So, so far, the estimated cost of ransomware for 2020 was $20 billion. Uh, one of the interesting components here is the fact that there, the, there was a 171% average increase in the ransomware payout, uh, meaning that cyber criminals are, are expecting a lot more money, uh, regardless of the size of the organization. And then ultimately, I think one that we're all familiar with is what is the average cost of recovery? And this isn't what is the cost of the ransom, it's how much is it costing organizations who do recover for ransomware from a downtime perspective, 
from a reputational damage uh, perspective, even from an internal productivity perspective as well. It's clear that, that this isn't going anywhere, and we have to address this. And really what we want to talk about today is, you know, from, from a Zerto and tier point perspective, where, where can we provide value? How do we differentiate from the traditional approach that you see within data protection? And what's interesting about that, right, if, if you think about the NIST framework and how long it's been existing, nothing's really much changed around the data protection side. You know, some, some backup vendors and all of us, uh, we're going to talk about certain aspects of vulnerability scanning around detection, identification. But the core component that is m much more important today is recovery, right? From a data protection perspective, we should be focusing on the recovery side. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you think about the history of the industry, uh, a lot of the budgets, a lot of the focus was exclusively on the preventative side. But based on this threat landscape that we exist in, it's clear that we need a bend, don't break approach meaning we need a safety net, an ability to be able to recover that data, not if, but when an attack happens. But what organizations are using is the same technology that's been around for decades. Whether it was uh, incrementally improved, right? It's still a foundation of, of legacy backup is what's being used around recovery from ransomware. And what I mean by that, by legacy backup, uh, not even disaster recovery solutions. Organizations are using backup tape and disk and they expect that that's the ability for them to be able to recover. Now, we have a customer who suffered a ransomware attack before they joined Zerto. And this customer was using backup tape and disk. They had a crypto locker attack and they inherently lost 12 hours of data. It took them over two weeks to be able to recover. The data loss is important, uh, but for most organizations, not only is the data loss important, but really the most disruptive element as well is how long this IT organization needs to spend uh, cleaning things up, recovering and getting that data back. That, those are two weeks that from your IT team that you're not getting back. So it's not just about the recovery point objective with data loss, but it's also on the RTO side as well. Now, why is that? Why, why do you see an inherent data loss? Why does it take so long to be able to recover? Well, and the reason is that organizations are using legacy backup not on a converged DR and backup approach where they're using both replication and copies of data to recover, but they're simply using their traditional backup solution, uh, which you can see here, a version of that, right? This architecture that you're seeing is, is a software-based backup solution, but that requires a lot of agents. Uh, essentially what's happening, as you can see, with different variations depending on the vendors that, that we're talking through, right? For example, this will be similar to a Veeam architecture, or you'll see a Commvault. It'll be a little bit different on the appliance-based backup side. But ultimately, the principle is that with all traditional periodic backup solutions, you're just taking a snapshot of that VM, moving that data somewhere, and hoping that you're able to recover from it. Now, that's already an, an, an important situation that we'll talk about, but it's also important to know most of these applications that are being backed up are being backed up at incremental points, which, which causes a lot of issues. And as we've stated, ransomware attacks and encryption scenario and having to recover from that is simply just a recovery scenario. Shouldn't just be backup and in a silo and then the DR team tries to do something. It should be all hands on deck, one solution that can do both and help them recover. So it's important to note this difference. And one thing that I mentioned was, was the inherent data loss that you see within legacy backup, right? Taking a VM snapshot. And as we all know, the reason this happens is you're simply archiving uh, that data after you take snapshots through a nightly backup job. This causes an issue on production. Sometimes those backup jobs don't finish, but even if they do finish, you just have one checkpoint or one copy for that day. So if you have a scenario where you have a ransomware attack or any type of event in the evening, your only ability to recover is from the day before. So even if this solution is working 100%, it is still going to inherently introduce data loss. Now, that's RPO, right? That's, that's an important component, but time is the most crucial thing for IT organizations, right, within the infrastructure team. And so if you think about what we discussed, the, the multi-VM uh, applications that, that every organization has to recover. If you have a traditional backup solution, uh, you are taking multiple copies of the VMs that belong to that application at different checkpoints. 
This is fine when you're just bagging it up and archiving it. But when you actually have to recover, it's a pain. It's a pain to find a consistent way to recover that application, not just consistently, but quickly as well. That's where you see weeks where organizations are rebuilding file directories after a ransomware attack. So th those are really the, the, the two challenges that organizations using data protection are facing, right? Uh, not being able to get all of their data back, but also taking a very long time in order to instantly be able to recover that data. Now, how, how is Zerto and the partners that it works with different, right? Well, it's really in our foundation of continuous data protection. And at the heart of continuous data protection is our replication solution. We approach this very differently, and we're not taking VM snapshots. What we're doing is, first off, our architecture is software only. It's a simple deployment that's a scale-out architecture, and it's near-synchronous replication that's happening at the hypervisor level. So this isn't array-based replication that you're fixed to certain hardware. This is independent vendor-agnostic replication where you're simply able to observe and write changes every five seconds, replicate them to a target site. For example, a tier point, and, and, and Everett's going to talk about that as well, and it's our ability to replicate to that and copy that data to a long-term retention site that's going to be able to help. This is the difference between losing 12 hours of data and losing a couple of minutes of data. It's a big deal, and especially if you think about it from a comparison perspective to, let's say, a Veeam or other organizations, if you look at it from a VM snapshots versus replication perspective, uh, it's simply not close. Because with Zerto, you're creating thousands of checkpoints in one day. With any backup vendor or any legacy traditional backup vendor, you're taking one or two snapshots a day. So that gives you an insight into the RPO. But the other aspect that's very important is RTO. And that's where the journal comes in. The Zerto journal, think of it as the recovery mechanism, the ability to simply rewind back in time, select a checkpoint, and recover. Now, it doesn't matter if you're performing a failover and recovering an entire site, or you're recovering an application, a VM, or even file level recovery. What makes Zerto special is that any of these move, failover, restore, recovery operations are all happening within a few clicks. And the beauty of that too is the fact that it's extremely simple, as you can see on the screen, to simply navigate and select all the checkpoints. Now, one of the things that I mentioned before was the, the consistency of an application, right? If I am using a traditional backup solution, it's going to be nearly impossible for me to quickly recover all of the VMs that pertain to that application to one checkpoint or to one consistent point in time. What we do differently is we treat these applications as a single entity. And what I mean by that is you're able to configure what we call a virtual protection group. And this virtual protection group allows you to designate all of the VMs that belong to that application, and then it, becomes, it starts replicating at the same point in time. So as it's replicated, if you need to recover to a specific checkpoint, even five seconds away, you're recovering all of the VMs that belong to that. This saves a lot of time, but it also makes sure that you don't have additional downtime and additional data loss. Right? If you think about the, the traditional approach to data protection when it comes to the 321 rule, the NIST framework, it doesn't mention SLAs there, really. So you know, when we're looking at modern organizations, modern enterprises, whether financial, healthcare, even retail, uh, SLA is important. And it's not a matter of just about if I can recover from ransomware, but how quickly can I do so? And how can I minimize the data loss? And that's the important piece, right, um, where we saw the same customer who before having Zerto suffered a ransomware attack, they suffered another ransomware attack, but this time had a much different experience, meaning they were using continuous data protection, right? They used replication instead of VM snapshots to recover. Uh, they selected a checkpoint 10 seconds before the moment of the encryption, and in order to just select those and identify what they needed, it took a very, very minimal amount of time. So if I had two slides to explain how important, how easy Zerto is from a ransomware perspective, this is an, an important one to know. So with that, before I transition over to Everett, because a really important piece of this is Zerto is the technology that you're using. But organizations need much more than just the technology. They need the guidance, the experience, 
sometimes the infrastructure and the managed services to be able to be confident when it comes to a ransomware attack. We have resources here for you, the Zerto-based resources, where you, you can download a lab, uh, really see it for yourself, and understand exactly what does that look like, what does a restore function or a failover function look like, so you can get an idea of what that experience could look like for you instead of using legacy backup. But with that, I, I really want to mention that it's extremely important to note that it's not just having the technology. The best practices, the infrastructure, and the guidance is extremely important. It's much more cost effective uh, to seek the guidance of third party expertise before something happens than after. So it's really important to note that. And with that, I'm going to transition over, over to Everett. Hi, thank you very much, Andy. Um, yeah, so as Andy was talking about uh, here at SharePoint, what we've done is we've taken and uh, the Zerto platform. And over the last 11, 12 years, uh, we started out a long time ago perfecting this, but we've come to the market in Gartner, Forrester, and also being recognized by Zerto as one of the leaders in this space. Uh, as you can see on the screen, there's um, you know, D, uh, Gartner DR market guide. Uh, we're recognized in the Forrester wave. And in the Zerto uh, MSP, we were recognized in 2001 as the Partner of the Year. Oh, there we go. Uh, and uh, for some of you, you may not be familiar with who Tierpoint is, but uh, in a sense, we're a U.S.-based uh, company in the uh, North America that is and provides uh, managed services for. Uh, over 40 data centers in 20 markets with a comprehensive portfolio. And we're able to offer this to our customers uh, throughout the globe. And how we've done that is we've bundled together. Where? Sorry, the, there we go. Uh, is a multifaceted approach on ransomware protection. And that is, not only having the Zerto on the back end for the cloud-inspired recovery, but also on the front end to have a proactive security pro portfolio uh, with WAF, DDoS, uh, and intrusion detection, mitigation, universal threat um, management firewalls, and a true portfolio that gives customers the best protection on the front end, but also deploying and utilizing one of the best tools in the marketplace for back-end recovery from crypto lockers and cyber intrusions. Uh, and in a, in a full guide of what SharePoint does is kind of found on this screen here. And as you can see, we, we do a lot. We do not everything, but what we do, we do well. Uh, we're able to use this technology in making a wrapper like an onion around the customer and protecting them from the inside out. So not all two customers are the same, but what we've done is we've taken products, standardized them in our operational efficiencies and proficiencies, uh, put 800 uh, professionals behind you and propel you into a protected environment that is a resilient transformation, right? So it's uh, you at the center, the customer, and then the services that we offer around you as it goes out. And what we find is that um, DRAS is the beginning of that, but we also offer backup services uh, using many, many technologies. And Zerto being the uh, network video recorder, we're able to execute on not just a daily basis, but, uh, you know, monthly, 24-7, 365, with that SLA uh, that Andy was talking about, and make that a guaranteed recovery so that you and your business is mitigating the risk the best you can so that uh, in deferring, and it's like an insurance policy, if you can spend a dollar up front, it saves you many dollars on the back end. It's a pound uh, ounce of prevention for the pound of cure. Uh, and, you know, we have many success stories and uh, solutions that uh, detail this. Now, we can't really 
tell you who or what, but um, our exact, account executives are, you know, very proficient in uh, describing and, and working with customers on uh, solutions engineering uh, to get a solution that comes to the forefront of what the customer needs. It isn't what we want, it's what you want. So, And through that partner in, in recovery, what we do is we, we have a planning consulting session. We come to you, meet you where you are, and really design a solution around you, uh, utilizing all the tools that we've operationally uh, perfected and are very capable of bringing to you without having, you know, while it is easy, um, you know, you are able to focus on those functions beyond just the lock and tackling, you can do more strategic uh, functions. And so during these exercises, what we do is we uncover all the stones through an assessment process. And we have a very uh, known methodology of how that works. Um, we really like to work with people and find the human element matching it with the technical um, expertise that we have within our organization. And I think, Andy, with that, I'm going to, um, is there time for questions? Uh, I wanted to leave some time for that. If there... Absolutely. Yeah, we do have some time for questions. A great presentation. Really appreciate that. Uh, Andy and Everett, uh, we, we do have some questions. While we do that, I'm just going to bring up this poll for everyone out there that says, what additional information would you like about the Zerto and Tierpoint solution? And so we'll leave that up while we take uh, your audience questions. Um, first question that came in, actually, I like this comment. I want to share this uh, from Jared out there who said uh, he wants to say that he is a Zerto user, and it saved them uh, a few times with live failover, and uh, sounds like he would highly recommend it. And he wanted to share that with everyone on the event today, so that's always good to hear. Uh, and first question I do want to ask you is, do you see ransomware as a backup or a DR scenario? Uh, I, do you want me to answer or Andy to answer first? Uh, from TierPoint's perspective, it is the catch-all tool. It's a BCDR tool, but uh, we do leverage other tools uh, to not only protect in different methods and different ways, but we, we use Zerto from a DR perspective mostly, but it does have capabilities from a, a backup as well. But okay. Yeah, and, and one thing I'll add to that, what, what I mentioned is the, the way that we approach it is from recovery and restore, whether it's from an immediate disaster scenario that you need to recover from something an hour or two ago, or if it's a long-term, you know, more compliance-based recovery. What we do is, is both converge DR and backup. And the question to the answer of round is ransomware backup or DR? I, I think it's whatever gives you the best recoverability, whatever gives you the best SLA, it's going to vary depending on the type of organization, the, the type of replication solution that you have and where you're recovering from. Uh, but it should be whatever you have that gives you the best. For some people, that might be their backup. For some people, it might be their DR. It's all about the timing and, and the type of attack as well. Got it. Okay. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. Another question here about Zerto. Is it software only or is it hardware as well? Yeah, so we're software only. And what that means is that an organization, not only is it software only, but it's also a scale out architecture. So you can scale easily from a couple of VMs to, to thousands, but you pick the infrastructure that you want to work with. Uh, meaning if you want to replicate locally to your production site, but you need the services of a tier point, you can replicate the tier point and, and you can just use your environment or have it managed by them. But really the, the, the focus of what we do is just allowing organizations to do what's best, not to get married right to a specific type of storage or to a specific cloud, but to get that option to, we see organizations move from the public cloud back down using Zerto, and then they go to a service provider because they need a little bit more. 
Um, so it's about flexibility. Got it. Okay. And then another question here, um, does Zerto just back up virtual machines? Yeah, so Zerto, the, what we talked about today and the explanations that we provided was from a VM perspective, but we also deliver backup and disaster recovery uh, for SaaS, right? So you think Salesforce, Microsoft Teams, Google Workspace. And one of the most exciting capabilities and products that we have as well within our platform is data protection is code, meaning being able to uh, protect your containerized workloads, think Kubernetes. Uh, so it's VMs, SaaS, and Kubernetes. Nice. And then there's another question here they're asking, um, when it comes to, uh, sorry, I lost the question here. And what about testing? I like this question. Am I able to test full or partial DR uh, capabilities on a regular basis? Yeah. So, so from, uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Well, from Andy's perspective, the testing is like is in bubble testing or full testing. To your point, we offer te that in our managed service, right? So you can do bubble test or full test in across your whole environment or partial. So it's any and all. Nice. Um, Jeremy is asking, what about training and, and time to feel confident in, in the product and the solution? Um, maybe both of you might want to chime in on that. Yeah, absolutely. So from, from our perspective, Zerto and myself coming from a, a different types of backups organization, Zerto is, is the easiest to install, configure, and manage. Um, we have the fastest POCs. Uh, and it's extremely easy simply because you, you do the software install, you configure the applications that you want, and then you're able to test that recovery. And the most important piece is that I can teach anybody to do a failover or a recovery with Zerto because it's just a couple of clicks. Uh, and, and the UI is simple. So we, we experience and we see a, a big differentiation there, but Everett can probably provide some more, some more feedback there considering that they're actually also executing failovers using Zerto. Yeah, and we're able to uh, not only do those failover, um, the training, right? The training, the testing, the validation, it's the people wrapper, right? So it's us getting to know your business and how you operate and how you want to recover, whether it's a managed service or you want a DIY, right? So it's any and all between. We don't want to get in your way of making you successful. Um, and whatever technology you bring, you're, you, you know, the, like SAP, SAS, whatever it is out there that you have um, and putting a, a, a run book together so that it is cohesive and it's represented in a portal and there's controls around who can execute that. So from our perspective, we, you know, while Zerto plays a really, really important role, it is not just one piece, but it's one of many pieces that we wrap around the customers. Does that help? Does that answer? It does. Yeah, great yeah. great answer. All right. Well, I'm afraid we're starting to run out of time here in our live Q&A session. Um, there's many more questions there for you in the electronic queue, uh, Everett and Andy. A great presentation. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you. Thank you. For more information on Zerto and TierPoint, check out the Handouts tab, and you'll find a TierPoint fact sheet right there entitled Cloud to Cloud Recovery, Disaster Recovery as a Service. Uh, it's got some more details and uh, diagrams on exactly how the Zerto and TierPoint solution works together. So make sure that you check out that resource. And of course, visit tierpoint.com and zerto.com for additional information. And thank you to everyone for the excellent questions. Uh, we will route those over to Everett and Andy to respond to, and I'll leave up the poll question for everyone to answer while I break the big news here about our next gift card, another Amazon $500 gift card. This one's going to Kurt Landis from North Dakota. Congratulations, Kurt Landis from North Dakota. Three more grand prizes, uh, a, lot, a lot more gift cards to give out. Uh, six more, in fact, so make sure you stay tuned for those.
All right, thanks to everyone who responded there to the poll. Let's go ahead and move on now to our next presentation on today's Megacast. I'm excited to introduce Mr. Carl Norwich, go-to-market lead for AppFlows at Rubrik. Carl, are you there? I am, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thanks for being on the Megacast today. Take it away, Carl. Hey, yeah, sure. Appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, for attending. Uh, again, I'm I'm Carl Norwich. I'm uh, what we call here at Rubrik uh, the go-to-market lead for AppFlows. It's a new orchestrated disaster recovery product uh, we recently brought to market, and we're uh, thrilled to talk to you about it today. Uh, just a little background on myself. i uh, been in tech for uh, about 20 years in a variety of roles. For the last 12, I've been really focusing on uh, go-to-market startup technologies, um, and I've uh, been with Rubrik really since the beginning as employee 47. So it's a real pleasure to talk to everybody here and give you a little background on Rubrik and more, more specifically around the DR product we're bringing to market. So just as we get started here, what we've done is essentially at, at our heart as a company, we're a, an orchestrated back, uh, or we're a backup company, I should say. And we've, we've reached unicorn status by Silicon Valley standards by radically changing and simplifying the way you manage and back up your data. And the DR part of it is layered right on top of that. So I think it's really important first to kind of understand our roots and understand the core value propositions that we could bring to your data center, to your operations team. So really the ten the, our key tenants are we want to automate data protection as much as we can. And we'll talk a bit more about that. But I want you to imagine a world where you're not managing jobs. You're not having to manage failures of jobs. You simply tell a platform what you want it to do and it'll take care of it. Uh, secondly, I think we can all agree that you know we have to worry about tornadoes, hurricanes, you know, act of God type of events in terms of disaster. But unfortunately for all of us, ransomware is really a much more likely scenario, and you need to figure out a way to have a last line of defense to recover your data and make sure it's secured. And on top of that, or uh, to that point, the way that we built the system is that we have an immutable append-only file system, meaning when I write data into this system, no, uh, it can't be changed by Rubrik or anybody who uh, anybody else. So really what we've done now is created a logical air graph with your data being locked in time in a secure manner so that you do have the ability to recover. So when we look at this from an operations perspective, if you look at how D, uh, backup has been done traditionally, you have a lot of decisions to make. First of all, you have to select which backup software you're going to pick. And then from that point, that vendor will typically say, I need this many backup servers, this many proxies so that I can ingest and thread the data. Then at that point, I need to figure out where am I going to store that data, a data domain, a disk drive, or something like that. Where can I store the data so I can have it in, uh, at my fingertips in the event that I need it? And then even longer term, if you're uh, beholden to any kind of compliance, then you would typically put it to tape and uh, send it off to a salt mine somewhere. And what we've done essentially at our core is that we've taken everything that you see here on the screen, the backup software, the backup servers, the proxies, media servers, replication, CDP, and the like, and we've consolidated it into one elastic piece of software where one we what we have the capability to do with our software is consolidate everything where you have a singular management point for all of your backup operations, which radically simplifies the way in which you manage your business. Secondarily, as I mentioned, it's not really described here, is that really at the core of all of that that changes the way you operationally manage is this concept of an SLA. Now, this system is self-managing uh, all the jobs that you ask us to do. But more importantly, if you think about the process that you may be dealing with today is that your business owners will come to you and say, here's my RPO and here's my RTO. You take those business requirements and you have to translate them in to a backup job. Imagine a platform where you could simply type in those require, type those requirements into the system and then we maintain that compliance on your behalf. So again, it's meant to be a low touch, set it once and forget type of solution. Next on the RTO, now, a lot of times this has really been cumbersome, and we've all been there, right? You get a ticket, user says, I deleted a file and I need it back. Unfortunately for us, a lot of times it's somebody important, so you have to go as quick as you can. And finding that information and recovering it can be extremely challenging. And sometimes just finding the file in the first place can be a challenge. So what we've done in this regard is that we've radically accelerated your capabilities of doing recovery from a, a recovery from backup perspective. What we're able to do is instantly turn your data on whether you be Nutanix, whether you be VM, or whether you be Hyper-V, we can even live mount SQL and Oracle databases so your DBAs can go in and pull tables out specifically if they need and get back out again in an extremely short amount of time. But the other thing is, the other thing is really important here 
is the way that we, because we can archive the cloud, the way that we can simplify finding these files and these data sets that you need. Now, when you go through and you search for these files, we not only search what's locally available on our system, but we're also searching any of your archive targets that may be in the cloud in a single workflow. So you don't have to worry about jumping from one interface to the next in order to find your data. And lastly, from a standpoint of saving, right, I mean, I think that we can all agree that we're trying to go to an OPEX mode uh, type of approach. You want to do just-in-time consumption. You don't want to have to do this idea of what am I going to need three years from now and then buy it all up front. You don't want to do forklift upgrades and all these types of things. So with our system, what you do is it's, we have a subscription model. We do have hardware that, that is inclusive with that. And essentially what you do is just buy the front end terabytes that you need, get the entitlements that you need, and then you can continue to grow that over time. So you have, now have a just-in-time consumption model as opposed to having to pay to everything at the front. Additionally, because of the way we've designed the system, there are no forklift upgrades. You're able to readily expand our cluster, retire, and add nodes at ad hoc whenever you need to. So imagine the, the value of having persistence in that, where you're not having to transfer data to another, another cluster as you buy stuff every three to five years. And as a consequence of that, our customers are gaining 30 to 50% cost savings over time. All right, so that's a little bit about the foundation of Rubrik. Well, let's talk about my baby, if you will, our orchestrated disaster recovery product that we call AppFlows. So the best way to compartmentalize this is that we've layered in a service that could be analogous to, say, an SRM, for an example, Site Recovery Manager from VMware, where we're, what we're going to do is be able to give you the ability to have application availability across sites. So first, I think it's important to understand our approach here, and this will give you a little bit of insight into the company as well, is that as I mentioned a moment ago, we've made, our roots are in backup and recovery on-premise and in the cloud, including AWS, Azure, and Office 365. So what we've understood as a company is the fact that I've captured all of that data is extremely, has a lot of potential value. Because having all the data consolidated in one place, why can't I derive more business value out of it? But the key here is that at the end of the day, we're a SaaS software company. We're not a hardware company. So how can we derive more value out of your backups without having to sell you more hardware? And the first step to that for us was creating a SaaS platform, a delivery model that we call Polaris. The idea behind this is twofold. One, it's a, a, an aggregation point of all the particular workloads that you may be backing up, whether it be Office 365, whether it be um, EC2 instances, whether it be uh, VHDs in Azure, whether it be on-premise VMware and et cetera. And this gives you an aggregate point to look at your entire business from a single point. But additionally, what it allows us to do is defer all the overhead of additional services onto the, player, onto the SaaS platform and not have to sell you more hardware. One example of this is for ransomware recovery. It's a product that we call Radar. Now, um, what we do is we watch your data, watch the backups over time, learn your data sets, and if we see something out of the ordinary, we can alert you and let you know that something is suspicious and you should investigate it. So it's an alerting mechanism, if you will. But more importantly, if you think about operationally, if anybody here has had to recover from ransomware, is the next thing, your, your next biggest question is, what the heck got hit, right? What is the blast radius? And that's where this tool comes in, in extremely handy. You can, it'll quickly be able to tell you which workloads and which business services have been impacted. Secondly, we have data governance. We're able to look at your data, use analyzers to look at your PII information, your HIPAA compliance, your customer social security numbers, credit cards, or where you think they should be if the right users have access to those folders so that you can quickly run reports and take remediation action. Now, the key thing about both of these products that I just mentioned is that they require no additional hardware beyond what you're already using for backup. So as I mentioned, these are, service, these are ways for us to derive more business value for you out of your backups. And that's how we're delivering app flows, the, oh, the, the disaster recovery solution we'll talk, we're talking about today, is that from our perspective, is you're already, if Rubrik's already backing up your workloads and it's already replicating them, the data movement's done. So now it's a matter of adding in the logic and the orchestration to bring your applications back online gracefully at a tertiary site. And that's exactly what we've done here. Essentially thinking about it is that we've decoupled the data plane from the logic plane in a SaaS delivery. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention as well, the best thing about SaaS for everybody on the phone who's an operator is that because it's SaaS delivered, you don't have to worry about code updates. You don't have to worry about hot fixes. You don't have to worry about those emergency emails from vendors saying, please update this as quickly as you can. We found a problem. We handle all of that for you. So you get to simply log into this platform and be a true consumer of a service. So when you look at the DR market as it stands now, it's certainly an incumbent market, meaning it existed before our product was brought to market. 
it was really important for us to understand from customer feedback what you don't like about what's out there today. And consistently, these are three areas that we heard, we, uh, we heard a lot of pain. First of all, the operational complexity of managing traditional DR solutions. They're challenging to set up, they're challenging to learn, and they're very cumbersome to manage during runtime. So we'll talk a bit about how we want to address that. Secondly, the expense. Um, from my perspective, again, having done this 20 years, I've, as I dove deeper into some of the incumbent products that are in this space, I've never seen a more vendor-centric licensing model. Uh, you pay per VM or per set of VMs. You have pay gates for all these different features. Uh, you even have pay ceilings with some products. If you use too much of it, you have to pay more money, which seems kind of uh, backwards. So we've simplified this, and I'll skip to the end on this one, where it's, it's, uh, it's subscription licensing and it's per appliance. And you simply pay for the year, and there will be no pay gates ever with our product. So you get entitlements to anything that we innovate and add onto the product without additional incurred cost. And lastly, I think we can all agree, free rounds of golf and free lunches are nice from vendors. But at the end of the day, less vendors you have in your data center, the more operationally efficient you are. So not only are we bringing DR into our portfolio, but also we made a real effort to make the product integral to the way you manage Rubrik today so you don't have to learn a whole new tool. Net net, if you if you can use Rubrik, you're going to be able to use Zapflows. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how it works. So first of all, let's talk about the vernacular. So in this market, you hear things such as Runbook, Virtual Protection Group, or something to that effect. Our equivalent is going to be what we call an application blueprint, or blueprint for short. So think of this as a logical container where you're going to tell us this set of VMs is representative of a particular application. It's also where you're going to tell us things such as what boot order do you want us to bring the VMs online at the DR site? What compute and storage do you want us to leverage? Uh, what networking do you want us to apply to those VMs? And most importantly, at the end of the day, we are a backup company. What backup policy do you want us to apply to these workloads once the failover is complete so backups continue? Unfortunately for all of us, just because you had a, a failover event doesn't mean you get to stop backing up your data. So in terms of RTO, we actually have, uh, two, diff we have two different options, which is unique to the marketplace. We have something that we call incremental export, which is a standby model, if you will, and then we have on-demand export. So let me walk you through this real quickly. If you imagine that the, uh, on the left-hand side, that's your production data center over your production rubric, and we're backing up your data. And I should mention that we're an incremental for ba forever backup system, meaning we take one full, and after that, it's incrementals forever. And then we're replicating that data over to a DR rubric in your DR site. What incremental export is going to give you is the ability, and what we're doing essentially is adding a third leg to that replication, where that DR brick is going to push that data into the data store proactively. Now, we're not going to power those VMs on. We're not even going to give them networking. But what we're essentially doing is staging the data. And as additional backups are taken on the primary side and then replicated to the DR side, we're going to incrementally update those images. So the latest RPO is always sitting in the waiting, ready to rock. And what this does is it gives you a ton of consistency around RTO because we're not having to move any data in order to bring your application back online. Now, you can select from any RPO available on that DR brick, which is uh, tunable to your liking. And we'll simply just rewind those images to the point in time, which means we only have to transfer that delta in order to bring them back. So we're still, even if you're picking a previous point, we're minimizing the amount of data that needs to be transferred. So that's, that's something that's more of a traditional model. The great part about incremental export is I get a very fast RTO. Downside is I'm using primary storage during runtime, even if I'm not really using it. And that's where on-demand comes in. On-demand is a similar concept. I'm backing up in production. I'm replicating to DR. However, we're not going to push that data into that data store until you break glass and hit the big red button or run a DR test. And we think this is really unique because think about how you buy DR today. You don't buy it for all your apps typically. You just buy it for your tier zeros and your tier ones because of the cost associated. I mentioned earlier we license, uh, we license by appliance by year, which is very straightforward. But most, more importantly is we don't even have to consume primary storage until you absolutely have to. So this allows for your operators to get the benefit of the automation without the overhead of having primary storage on those Tier 2, Tier 3 apps. Um, for RPO, it's, uh, it's our RPO available for Apple is used is, really is, is uh, driven by how often you do your backup cadence. But we can go any, essentially anywhere from a daily all the way down to CDP with a 60-second RPO available on the DR side. Now, what's unique here also is that within this blueprint, the VMs can have varying SLAs. So imagine you have a three-tier app with a web server, an app server, and a database server. You don't want to run CDP into your web server. It's a waste of resources. Why, why would you bother? So let's back it up daily. And on the app server, most applications, now those are largely stateless, but you still want to capture configuration changes. So let's back it up every, say, four or eight hours. But on the database layer, 
Let's run CDP against that so I can minimize transaction loss. And all three of those can live in the same blueprint. And when you go to do a recovery, the system will call out that variance in RPOs so you can make a decision, am I comfortable with that? Or do I want to dial it in a little bit closer to something that's healthier for the app if, it, if needed? So it's all about flexibility here. Um, fail over and fail back is two clicks in a confirmation phrase. Um, it's very straightforward. Now, failing back is just an inverse of the fail over. And what we've done here is, if you remember, I mentioned that in this blueprint, we also assign an SLA to your workloads. It serves two purposes. First of all, of course, it's backing up your, the purposes of backing up your data. But secondly, what it's going to do is start trying to replicate back to production as quickly as that site can come online if that's not a smoking hole type of an event. That means that we're automatically synchronizing your data back to production as quickly as that site can come back online, automatically with no operator intervention. So that means that truly your fail back is just an inverse of your failover, two clicks and a confirmation phrase. And then lastly, the product can, of course, do DR testing, but we also have canned compliance reporting so that you can give that to your operational leadership or to anybody within your or, or to any auditors that you may be beholden to to prove that you are DR ready. All right, so lastly, I have a couple more slides and then we'll field some questions. Is that, as I mentioned at the onset, is that we have the reality we have to all face is that ransomware is really the modern disaster. It's something that we have to deal with daily, and everyone goes through as many preventative steps to stop it proactively as they can. But what if they get through? We really need to focus on a way of how can we get your business back line if the worst were to happen. And really, Sean said it best here by saying he's 10 times more worried about ransomware than he is about a, a hurricane or a tornado, for example. So let's talk through that a little bit. So what if the inevitable happens? So first of all, we need to kind of think about all the things that Rubrik has in this portfolio. First of all, we have an immutable append-only file system, which means your data is in a vault. Secondly, I mentioned earlier that we have that product radar, which watches your data sets and looks for anomalies so that it can detect a ransomware attack and give you that insight. Now, what we've changed here is that we've integrated radar and app flows together. And why that's unique is, is remember that you created these blueprints. You've defined the applications within the rubric ecosystem by, by way of app load. So now when you're in radar, instead of seeing a list of VMs, you're going to see a list of business services that are now impacted. So that's the first step here is what has been impacted and is quick, figure that out as quickly as we can. The second part of it is, is to which point in time do I recover? How quickly and where do I want to recover to? Now radar is going to recommend a point in time to, for you to recover to that was previous to the malicious behavior. And what we've done is that we're going to pre-populate those times into app flows for you as you go through and do your recovery wizard. So you don't have to worry about taking information from one tool and placing it in another. And then lastly is how do I recover? Now, no matter how easy I or any of my competitors make DR, operationally DR is a painful thing, failing to a DR site. And it's already going to be chaotic if you've been hit by ransomware. So when you go through and say, yes, I want to recover these applications, we're going to go to your production VMs and rewind them to the point in time that you've selected and then reboot them in the order that it was prescribed per the blueprint and bring your application back online gracefully at the RPO you selected. So you don't have to fail over to DR in order to recover from a ransomware attack. Again, easing the burden on the operations team as they figure out how this happened and how to prevent it for the next time. So with that, that was about the end of my presentation. So I will um, stop there uh, and I'm happy to field any questions that you all may have and thank you for your time again. Absolutely, yeah, great presentation. Uh, we do have some questions for you from the audience, Carl. And while we do that, I'm just going to bring up this poll for everyone out there that says, what additional information would you like about the rubric solution? So um, first question that came in here, Carl, I wanted to ask you is uh, they want to know what impact is there on production when doing DR testing with rubric? Um, there's no impact. So when you dis when you set up these blueprints, you actually set up two different networking configurations, one for production use in the case of an actual DR event, and then one that would be used for testing, which is going to be typically isolated from the production network. And that way we can spin your workloads on. They are live. They are, they have, and you, so you can pass transactions or verify, but it's in an isolated network group, so there's going to be no impact to production whatsoever. Very nice. That's cool. And then another question here, if VMs are part of the orchestration workflow, they're asking if you can identify if they were corrupted with ransomware. Yeah, and that's exactly what we went over a moment ago with that radar integration. So again, we're really I like to think of this as tools in a tool shed and what can I build? Because we have radar, that ransomware remediation software, 
is an available uh, available tool for us to leverage. And by integrating it with app flows, not only can we, again, detect everything and do it at an application level, but we can also integrate the recovery as uh, the recovery is a fast track. Nice. I like that. The tools on the tool shed or the, the like Batman with the tool belt there, you've got all different tools you can pull out anytime you there need you. them. There you go. Uh, next question, they're wanting to know, can you use Rubrik for some assets and other DR software for others? Um, you certainly could. I mean, you can. they can coexist. I mean, we, we're only going to protect and interact with what you direct us at. Um, I would say that we, we feel like we have a very strong story across the board. But certainly if there's some particular workloads um, that we don't support or that you just don't feel comfortable with using Rubrik for, we can certainly coexist. We're very... Uh, deterministic in terms of what we what we're interacting with based on your input to us. Got it. Okay. And then there's another question here. Um, does Rubrik support multi-cloud or hybrid cloud data protection? A hundred percent. So again, it's back to that analogy of tools in the tool shed. So, <laughs> oh, excuse me. So um, we can of course protect on-prem workloads, um, and we do have the capability to protect cloud-native workloads that may be running in Amazon or uh, Azure, for an example, in Office 365. And the, I think the nicest thing about how we've approached this is that Polaris SaaS platform. Now, what that allows for you to do is orchestrate all of your backup and recovery operations, whether it be cloud-native or on-premise, from that one focal point. So it really gives you a one-place, uh, one-stop shop from an operator perspective, how you're managing your business and how you're taking care of all your recovery and backup operations. Very nice. Very nice. And then, uh, let's see, there's another question they want to know, are you able to schedule DR testing at regular intervals to satisfy the auditors? So we don't have the scheduling tool in um, AppFlows yet, but we're planning on it. But what's nice about Rubrik as an approach is that we're an API-first company. And with AppFlows, we do have SDKs, so we can actually go and do it. We can do it programmatically, we, but again, we do intend to add it to the platform. The other thing I'd mention there is that uh, this is my, uh, my technical counterpart's favorite, uh, favorite uh, part of the system is the automated cleanup. So when you go through and do a DR test, you can set the error handler to either pause or to abort and clean up, which means we'll clean up the mess behind ourselves. So there's absolutely no reason you can't programmatically schedule DR testing. And if something fails, we'll go in and clean up behind ourselves and not leave a mess in any of the V centers or ESX hosts. I like that. Very cool. Um, next question they want to know, what about uh, fail back? You can fail over, but Sean's asking, how do I fail back? I love it. Yeah, no, we're not Hotel California, uh, so don't worry. Um, so as I mentioned, so fail back is just the same process as failing over. So remember when, we, when you define this blueprint, you're, again, you're telling us what backup policy to assign to it so we can continue protection. But part of that is also the replication target is going to be your production site, your original production site. So if you had a you know a power outage or some sort of a transient event or you know insert here, but that that data center came back online, those bricks are going to reconnect, and then we're going to start synchronizing the data back over to production or the original production, I should say. And then that's this again, it's the same process of, as you went on the failover. You tell us where to land, which data store to use, which you do have to declare on the failback, and then you just say failback. And what we do is we actually go to the production workloads, take an on-demand backup so that we can catch any deltas. We power the VMs off, and then we fail everything over and then bring them back online, of course, over on the primary side. So it's a zero data loss uh, failover and failback, assuming the site wasn't lost, uh, you know, if it was more scheduled or planned. Awesome. Uh, next question, what about AppFlows? How does that fit in with Rubrik? Is this a, a separate product you add on if you already have Rubrik, or what's the model there? Yeah, absolutely. It, it is an add-on to Rubrik. So it does require, of course, like the Rubrik backup, because really the theme here is we're trying to we're, – we're making your backups more valuable to you, if that makes sense. But the foundation there is, of course, us capturing that data and backing it up. So this is something that you can – if you're a Rubrik customer today, you can certainly add into your portfolio. Um, but it, it is a requirement, of course, that Rubrik is backing up your your, uh, your workloads in order to leverage AppFlows. So it's not a standalone product, if you will. Got it. Okay. And so what's the easiest way to get started with Rubrik? What do you recommend? So a couple of things. So first of all, I would reach out to any of your, your partners that you work with. We're a channel-first company. Um, or, of course, you can reach out to Rubrik directly. And what we've done, and this is actually my old job, because I was a senior director for this, is we actually have cloud labs that are available. 
So if you want to go and hear a more thorough story of our capabilities, our approach, and our value add, and you're intrigued, we actually can give you an ability to go play with the product live online in the cloud so that you don't have to go through all the overhead of bringing gear on site and doing a proper POC while you're in your investigation phase, if you will. Um, so I would highly recommend reaching out, uh, again, directly to Rubric or to your channel partner. Uh, we have a huge channel partner network. Again, we're, cha we're channel first. But as you're going through and doing your due diligence, we do have the ability for you to interact with any of these products on a cloud lab with live with live VMware, live Rubric, and everything else, so that you can get your your hands dirty, if you will, without again having all the overhead of bringing in hardware. Sounds like a great op opportunity, easy way to get started. Uh, do it in a cloud lab. Uh, really great presentation, Carl. Thank you so much for being on the event today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. All right, for more information on Rubric, of course, visit rubric.com. Also, check out there in the Handouts tab, there is a uh, AppFlow's Automated DR Orchestration Handout that explains in more detail how AppFlow's work with Rubric. So make sure that you check that out. And of course, as Carl said, um, Rubric has Cloud Labs, so you can try this out for yourself in a virtual lab environment. All right, it's now time for our next prize announcement. We have an Amazon $500 gift card. This one's going out to Bruce Pena from North Carolina. Congratulations, Bruce Pena. And our second grand prize for another 3D printer. This is going to Jonas Manolason from Virginia. Jonas Manolason from Virginia. All right, still two more grand prizes and uh, five, four more, five more gift cards to give out on the event. So make sure you stay tuned for those, as well as our awesome presentations, of course. And with that, let's go ahead and keep the Megacast moving. I'm excited now to introduce you to our next expert presenter. Welcome, Mr. Alex Sammer, Senior Technical Product Manager at Faction. Alex, are you there? Yes, thank you, and welcome, everyone. So, We've covered a little bit on uh, cybersecurity, and we're just going to go ahead and um, take a closer look at a couple of options that we have. And uh, my webcast today is going to uh, take a look at data protection and cybersecurity, um, which is powered by the powered by the Faction Cloud Control volumes. Um, first of all, a little bit about Faction. It may not have been um, as pronounced as Rubrig or any of the others. Um, we've been founded in 2006, headquartered in Denver, Colorado. We are um, a, a provider for multi-cloud uh, connectivity um, to connect your data center into multiple clouds at the same time. And uh, just a couple of numbers, uh, over 100 petabyte under management. We have nine different locations to connect to the clouds and over 1,000 uh, end user customers. Um, a lot of pa patents that allow us to really take your data and make it accessible in multiple clouds at the same time. And with um, proven expertise um, from VMware, AWS, and Dell Technologies, and we're of course financially backed by Dell Technologies Capital, so we're um, here in a very good standing. The thing I wanna cover today is, you know, we talk a lot about um, backup, disaster recovery, and there's tons of solutions out there, but what we wanna talk uh, about today is two challenges. We'll just pick two of the multiple challenges that we have, and one is um, the protection against cyber attacks, right? And the other one is long-term retention of data. And we'll go a little bit uh, uh, deeper into these uh, topics and how to um, build a solution that can help you um, address these two issues. So what are today's challenges with cybersecurity and recovery, right? There's a lot of top industries that are under attack. And we just heard recently about the pipeline that got shut down due to a ransomware attack. So there's a lot of uh, um, bad guys out there that want to get money, governments that want to shut down certain things. And basically, we'll have to figure out a way on how to protect against those. The interesting part is that the medium time before you actually discover that you have a ransom attack is now 24 days, right? That seems a lot, but it used to be 
a much, much higher number. So basically software that is installed on the networks and other pieces can actually help discover these uh, ransom attacks much, much quicker. And basically most of the industries are under attack, right? Business, professional services, retail, healthcare, high tech, and financial institutions, everybody is a target for um, cyber attacks. So what can we do to protect against cyber attacks, right? Basically, we have to create an environment that allows us to have the data off network, protected through an IRGA, right? Which we call the isolated recovery environment or IRE, right? With an immutable data vault. That provides currently the highest level of security against those uh, threats, regardless if they're insider threats, ransomware attacks, or other cyber attacks. They're not 100% immune to the risk, right? Because you could, it could actually happen that you replicate compromised data into the insulated uh, recovery environment, but it helps to protect to a very, very high level. This is always complementary to your traditional backup and disaster recovery plan, right? It does not replace it. So you still have to have your um, disaster recovery plan in place, your traditional backup, and you still have to follow all the best practices for the physical and virtual security. Everybody defines that a little bit different. So make sure that when you get all these different um, solutions advertised um, that you know what you're getting. Um, the solutions uh, differ a little in terms on how they do the air gap and how they uh, replicate the data. A couple of best practices that we're going to talk about when you do recover from a ransomware attack is, you know, you have your um, immutable copy of backup data in your air gap network location, right? You want to make sure that your ransomware is completely eradicated, right? So the, the, the risk is completed, you cleaned everything, and there's no risk of reinfection. So the malware that got put into the data center has been eliminated, and then you can do the uh, rapid restore. Some of the options that are allow us to do instant recovery options, right? So basically what that means is you have your cyber vault, right, where your copies are um, hosted, and you can take those and rapid restore them as virtual machines to access your data. And this method varies in performance and scale between the different backup architectures, but you have the option to instant recover uh, from an attack if you have that in the vault. So with that, there's a, another little piece to consider, right? Cybersecurity and cyber recovery, right? So cybersecurity is basically everything that you install to safeguard your data and systems from attack. Right, so firewalls, ransomware defender software, um, software that scans email attachments, you know, everything that helps you in real time to make sure that you do not, a cyber attack will not get through into your data center. Cyber recovery means you accept the risk that attacks and disruptions are happening, right? So you protect against those because sometimes especially if it comes from an insider or other sophisticated methods, it may not be um, catched at, before it enters the data center. So you accept the risk that will actually go into the data center. And that's where you have your copies in your vault so you can recover if that actually happens. So cybersecurity and cyber recovery are very complementary to each other, right? And you have to factor in both for your strategy on um, the security of your data. And the data is one of your biggest assets. So now that we covered a little bit of the cybersecurity and cyber recovery, um, let's go into the next topic, which is long-term retention. And some people have concepts about long-term retention. There's different options out there. I'm just listing two. One is the classic, if you have data that needs to be stored for 50 years or 80 years or 30 years even, you take that data and copy it onto tape or back it up on tape and then put it into an archive vault. The challenges that come with this kind of solution, of course, it's a lot cheaper than having it somewhere on premise on a media where you can quick recover, but the challenges are 
is that you need to get the tapes back if you need to recover that data um, through, through courier or you use one of the services, um, shipping services available. So basically it's a little slow and more difficult to manage um, from that perspective. The other option is you just keep it on your primary backup system, right? So you just keep all the data on there. And when you have to recover and manage that data, you just use your standard backup software and you know tools and you just recover it. The challenge that you have here is that the cost per terabyte um, that you store the data is a little bit higher than or much higher than on a tape or long-term archive solution. So you're spending a lot of money for data that gets rarely accessed. And some of these examples that we're going to cover now is, you know, the different industries have different retention policies that are governed, you know. So healthcare has to retain the data for patient lifetime, for example. The energy department um, or companies have to retain, you know, exploration data for a long time. R&D requires a lot of retention of different designs and R&D records. And uh, for example, financial services, life, uh, life insurance policies also have to be retained for a very long time. So you, there is a need, depending on the industry, to retain data for a very long time to meet those um, regulations that are out there. So how can we build something that allows us to retain the data for a long time, right? But we don't use tapes or other methods uh, to store the data offsite, but we don't have the challenges, you know, with the management and restore, but we also don't wanna pay the same amount for the long-term retention as we pay for our primary um, backup uh, storage. So one of our customers actually has a um, scenario where they have data domain virtual instances in Azure Right, so you can spin those up, you can take the, your Azure uh, data and you can use the DDVEs in the cloud to back your data up. What they do is they take that data from their multiple DDVE instances in Azure and replicate them onto a faction hosted um, physical data domain, right? To have the data in a second location and make sure that if something happens, uh, they can restore. The, the reason why they chose Azure for this is that with the express route local connection that is available from Faction to Azure, they don't pay any egress fees. So basically all the backups that they're taken out of Azure into the uh, data domain that is hosted by Faction uh, comes with no cost um, from an egress perspective. So what they have is they have two physical data domains, right? And active tier where they keep their data is going, <clears throat> it's uh, increasing and it's getting full. And the solution was that we added um, a long-term retention with cloud tiering, which is basically we tier the data out of the, uh, the active tier onto a object storage, in this case, a ECS uh, from Dell. And with that, the customer had, based on the policies that he said, um, the ability to move data that has not been accessed off their active tier, so free up space um, to make room for more backups that are coming in, but he also meets the long-term retention goals to ensure that, you know, if he needs to restore the backup, he can just go into his management software um, where he does the backups or into the data domains and retrieve that data directly from the object store and will place back into the active tier. So that is a very simple solution to basically retain data for a long time on a much, much less inexpensive system that also allows um, a very simple management. So when we take a look at the solution that this customer has, what can you do with a, a faction offered cloud control volume that is based by um, Dell's Power Project um, system? So we have multiple options. So one thing that Faction provides is a connection to multiple clouds. And the key differentiator here is that you can have one copy of your data hosted on a system and you can make it accessible through our patented technology and a Faction interchange um, network to multiple clouds at the same time. So you don't have to create a copy of your data to make it available in Azure and AWS at the same time. It's the same copy and you can use it in both clouds at the same time. 
So what we can do is we have the connections to all the different clouds, up to 100 gigabyte, um, gigabits per second connectivity to each cloud. So to make sure that your workloads uh, can be used in all of those clouds. And then what we can do is we can put a PowerProtect data domain inside the Faction data center. And you can use that as a backup target um, for the cloud um, applications, right? And you, so you can back up all your cloud applications into a single location. The other thing is you can also use your on-premise uh, PowerProtect if you have one and replicate that onto the PowerProtect at Faction. The flexibility that you gain here with the solution is that you can, in a case of a disaster, mount your backups in any one of the uh, clouds and spin up the virtual machines and access your data and work with it, right? So for example, if something happens in your primary data center, you mount the NFS from the PowerProtect in the VMware uh, cloud on AWS, spin up a couple of virtual machines and be back and ready. You can also use it at the same time to um, mount it in Azure or, Ada or Oracle. So that gives you a very high flexibility if a disaster strikes to get um, you know, your data back up and running if your data center may have some impacts like uh, flooding or something else that may happen. The other thing is we can set up a cyber vault, which goes back into the cyber recovery section that we uh, talked about in the beginning. So basically the management and analytics is in a air gap vault. So now you can use your on-premise um, power protect data domain system, replicate the data and replicate it into an air gapped data vault. You can also use, if you have the data replicated to action on-premise data domain, replicate that into your cyber vault for cyber recovery. And the third piece is you can also take any DDVEs that you may have in all the different clouds and protect them in the same cyber vault. So this gives you a lot of flexibility um, to protect your cloud data against cyber attacks, to protect your on-premise data against cyber attacks, as well as protect you know, your replicated uh, data that you have hosted at Faction into the cyber vault. And with the cyber recovery, software that um, is offered for this solution. There's an easy monitoring and recovery if necessary. And last but not least, you can also use um, the ECS object storage to long tier, term tier your data off the PowerProtect for long-term retention. And then use that data if necessary. If a record comes up, you can always spin that back onto your active tier and make sure that you can access your data when you need it with very simple management and recovery options. So basically, <clears throat> the solution that we can offer covers a lot of different use cases. It can help you build your disaster recovery system, um, backup and restore. It can help you to create a cyber security or a cyber recovery solution with the cyber vault. And it also can do the long-term tiering, and you can combine all these into one solution with the key point that all your data can be accessible if you need it in any cloud at the same time without creating additional copies. So with that, just to give you a quick overview in uh, our short time that we have, I'm open for any questions that may arise on this, uh, on these solutions. Absolutely. Yeah. Great presentation, Alex. We do have some questions for you. Uh, while we do that, I'm just going to bring up this poll for everyone out there that says, what information would you like about Faction? And this is a multi-select uh, question here, so feel free to select more than one option. And let's see, first question that came in here, uh, Jeremy is asking, um, how far back can retention go with Faction? And then is there any way to archive a volume for indefinite storage? So the, how far can you go back? Basically, you set the retention policy within your backup software or, um, or on the data domain direct if your backup support, uh, software does not support the cloud tiering function of the data domain. And basically, whatever is 
whatever data is stored on the data domain, you can set your policy to archive that out to um, your object storage, right? So typically you cannot archive anything that is not older than 14 days, right? That's a limitation. So it has to be older than 14 days and should not have been accessed for a while, but everything past that um, can be archived onto um, the object store. And then it's just a question how long you keep the object store alive um, for your long-term retention. The other option that you can do is if you say, hey, I'm not, I'm not using um, a dedicated object store within Faction. I want to tear that out, um, half of it to the, to the ECS that is hosted at Faction. And you can also use that and tear it out onto um, other object storage, um, for example, in the public cloud. Excellent. And then keep it um, for there. Keep it there for how long you want. Right. Okay. Good. Good solution there. Um, another question. Uh, they say they're dealing with you know various and increasing government regulations and restrictions. Uh, can Faction help uh, with those sort of compliance challenges? Yes, we can. We have a security team um, that makes sure that all the compliance. Um, questions and concerns are answered as well as implemented in the fact that it meets the government regulations. Great. Uh, and then is this, they're asking, is this an on-premises solution or a cloud-based solution? What's the kind of the architecture there? So the architecture is it can be, um, so usually we have the Power Protect system hosted at Faction, right? And you can either back up, if you're close enough to one of our data centers, you can either back up the data straight to it. It is co-located next to the cloud. And so it's basically um, a managed service with connections to all the clouds. And so it's kind of like a hybrid, but it allows you to use your data and back up your data into a central location and make it accessible in all clouds at the same time, if you need to. Very nice. And then what about scalability? Bradford's asking, how scalable is the solution? So this solution can go from um, basically 48 terabytes, which is our entry point, uh, up to multiple petabytes. Nice. And then what about, uh, let's see, for long-term retention, uh, they're asking, what's the approximate savings per terabyte for the cloud tier compared to the active tier? Not sure if you can answer that or not, but. Well, so we like did the calculation and the, the savings are approximately 70%, right? So it's 70% less than your active tier for the long-term retention on the object storage. Okay, okay, interesting. That's a, that's a big savings. I like that. Um, and then there's another question here. Other than cost reduction, is there an operational benefit to cloud tiering? Yes, it, it is. It depends. <laughs> there is a benefit, but it depends um, on what kind of long-term retention strategy um, the customer or the, the user is having, right? So if you're using tapes and you outsource the tapes into a vault, then there is definitely a management and operational impact, right? Because you don't have to deal with tape shipping and tape archiving and all these kind of things anymore. You set your policy and it's all being done automatically, right? So you do have a cost, cost saving and an operational saving. When you do keep everything on your active tier, right? The major driver for that is cost savings, right? Because you don't touch the data for a long time, but you have to keep it. And it takes a, a valuable space for your daily backups or weekly backups that you have to do and store on the system. And so basically the cost saving in not buying additional active tier, but taking that data and move it off to a lower tier storage um, is, as, we, as I said, about 70%. And that can be a significant uh, advantage. Got it. And then well, there's a couple questions here about exactly what can faction protect, you know, physical, uh, virtualization, hypervisor, uh, applications, or data, you know, in the cloud, what are the possibilities? Um, the, the possibilities are basically everything that you mentioned. Um, so we provide, you know, the managed services for it. When you have, for example, an on-prem uh, 
so, uh, data center, right, with all your applications, you use a backup software usually, right? And we work with all the major backup softwares, Networker, Evermar, Commvault, uh, Veeam. And you can, you can take that data and use that software, your, your usual software, to um, protect your data, uh, replicate it um, using the data domain or going straight into the faction data center. And then from there on, we can make the data available in all the cloud. So we're protecting cloud workloads, virtual machines, physical servers, and all the applications that are supported by your specific backup software. Excellent. And then when it comes to, to implementing you know, this uh, disaster recovery as a service, I, I get the idea that Faction has kind of experts to handhold and, and walk through this process. You want to talk a little bit about the how the onboarding and training would work? So, well, first of all, you know, we do an assessment, right, with the, with the customer or the client to make sure that we cover everything, all the security aspects about how do you move the data into it, Right, and so it's going to be a whole process um, with um, diagrams and making sure that we cover every single aspect of the security, you know, the backup, what is possible, what are the, the requirements. So we have a team of people who will help um, craft that for the customer. We do, we will have very shortly a hands-on lab that you can take online where you don't need to stand up um, any kind of a environment to just t try it out. We have that already for different CCVs if you want to see how it works to mount a volume in AWS and Azure at the same time and access the data. Uh, you can access those. And then once we're getting in the planning phase, um, we have a whole operations team that will guide you through the processing uh, from the onboarding, you know, all the, all the pieces that are required once the equipment is stood up to make sure that the configuration is um, you know, exactly how it was planned and fulfilling all customer needs. So basically from the time that we, you talk to us the first time until your system is fully operationalized with everything that uh, you want to have, Cyber Vault, long-term tiering, cloud access, we'll be hand-holding you through the whole process. Excellent. I, I like that. I'm sure that would be a, a huge benefit to a lot of companies who, you know, they don't have a lot of time. <laughs> They need to do disaster recovery. They want to get their data protection uh, in order, but uh, they really need some some help with that. So, uh, excellent. All right. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time in our live Q and A. There's some more technical questions there for you in the electronic queue. Uh, but Alex, uh, thank you so much for telling us about Faction. Thank you. For more information. Uh, check out the handouts tab. It's there that you'll find the full uh, presentation that Alex just. Uh, showed you here. You can download that and review it uh, in PDF form after the event. So make sure that you check that one out. And with that, I'm going to announce our next prize winner. We have another Amazon $500 gift card. This one's going to Trevor Mylock from Texas. Congratulations, Trevor Mylock from Texas. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our next set of presenters. Welcome Pavan Bedadala, Senior Director for Product Management, and Dave Orban, Senior Manager of Product Marketing from Comval. Pavan and Dave, take it away. Yep. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, so let's uh, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Dave Orban. I'm a Product Marketing Manager here at Comval, and I'm joined uh, today by Pavan Bedadala, who is the Senior Director of Product Management. Uh, in 2021, protecting your data and in particular uh, disaster recovery is vastly different from what it was even just a few short years ago. Uh, today, you've also got to reduce the surface area for cyber threats while at the same time strengthening your data security just in order to minimize business disruption. Uh, we've got supply chain attacks now, uh, so you really need to pay much closer attention to the edge. Uh, bad actors are now targeting your accessories, your employees' accessories, uh, vishing. Uh, Voice-based phishing creates new points of entry for the bad guys. Uh, zero trust. Here we are in this work-from-home environment uh, requiring constant validation and authentication. These have all become essential. Commvault provides the most robust data protection, ransomware protection, and recovery for the widest variety of workloads. Whether you're talking physical, virtual, cloud, or multi-cloud, uh, things like AWS and Azure, or SaaS, uh, things like uh, M365 and Salesforce, 
We simplify recovery within a single, unified, and infinitely scalable platform that features an intuitive user interface with role-based access control and even support for multi-tenant environments. Today, ransomware is probably the biggest challenge that we face more than any other threat, and it's affecting all aspects of business. We're currently working with a prospect, uh, for example, whose insurance company is raising their cybersecurity insurance premium four times due to a ransomware attack that they had a year ago. Uh, so for somebody in that position, we would propose uh, an air-gapped off-site backup that can provide not only protection and recoverability, but can also give them leverage to, to negotiate that insurance premium down. Um, so having the right solution has never been more important. So what's changed? First, we're going to take a look at how IT environments and in particular data centers have had to change over the last couple of years and what that means for protecting and recovering your data and workloads. Data has never been more valuable nor more vulnerable, and the threatscape continues to expand. You've got uh, uh, increasing app stack complexity with uh, web services, different dependencies, uh, geo distribution. Uh, you've got uh, increasing potential for threat actors, uh, including things like rogue users or uh, temporary employees, contractors, consultants. Uh, and again, this increasing surface for cyber attacks, uh, which includes uh, uh, you know, these expansive environments that you're working within and even your supply chains. So what that, what that boils down to, it's the, it, it increases the total downtime impact. Uh, first off, the value of your data to the enterprise has, has increased. This should come as a surprise to exactly no one. Data is mission critical to the modern organization. It's used to drive better, faster, and more accurate decision making and provide a foundation for ultimately for better business outcomes. Your data is more varied than it's ever been before. You name it, you're using it. Uh, transactional data, workloads, databases, virtual machines, containers, a wide variety of devices at the edge, and chances are that the protection and recovery solutions that you used even a couple of years ago just won't cut it anymore. Uh, data is no longer restricted to, to just your physical data center. Now it's on-prem, it's in the cloud, it's across multiple clouds, and more typically it's in hybrid environments. It's in your SaaS applications, things like Salesforce and M365, and spread across remote desktops and a myriad of different mobile devices and every bit of it needs protection. Uh, you've got this ever-increasing threat landscape that uh, I'm going to drone on and on about today. Uh, it's dramatically changed what we need to recover from along with how we need to go about doing so. Uh, you know, your, your old school, hurricanes, floods and tornadoes, hardware failure, that's, that's the easy stuff. Today's challenge uh, is really around cyber threats, and recovering from threats like ransomware requires a multi-pronged approach that combines early detection, prevention, and the ability to recover to a clean state quickly and without any data loss. The risks associated with being unprepared is greater, far greater than ever before, and that includes everything from business interruption to lost revenue uh, to uh, reputational risk, and that's just for starters. We talk a lot about data sprawl. Uh, your data didn't just show up all at once. You've been accumulating it over years in a variety of formats and across multiple locations. Uh, Multi-generational data sprawl leads to data fragmentation, provides an increased surface for attack, and complicates automation and process efficiency. And this basically, just, all, all together, it increases the potential risk of having a successful ransomware attack. Uh, with your data and workloads spread across all of these silos, it's almost difficult, if not impossible, to manage policies for them all. Now, what data sprawl does is it introduces risk and it restricts business growth. Because your data environment is not where it should be to provide the agility you need to, to grow your business, you know, these silos introduce risk to the business, they compromise uh, opportunity, and create impediments to growth. Uh, you've got data fragmentation, uh, adding complexity and, again, uh, potential points of failure. Uh, you've got an increased surface for cyber attacks because you've got to protect more data and more workloads in more location. Uh, of course, this is all exacerbated by the remote work that's been brought on by the pandemic. 
having these data silos and the consistent policies or lack of consistent policies across them basically increases your risk. Uh, it increases the uh, potential for unauthorized access to your data, uh, data leakage, and of course, uh, ransomware. And of course, you've got to contend now with increased regulatory and compliance requirements with new ones popping up every year from all of the different jurisdictions in which you, you apply your trade. Uh, you, you have a limited ability to scale and innovate quickly enough in order to meet the market demands. And this lack of automation and process efficiency strains your already limited resources. It's basically what the fragmentation does is it prevents your business from running efficiently, limits your ability to innovate and grow, and it creates what we refer to as a data integrity gap, which is basically the space between where your data environment is today, or in other words, the integrity of your data, uh, and where your data environment should be in order to provide a foundation that enables and even helps accelerate growth and allows you to easily navigate your ongoing digital transformation. Bottom line, though, is if your data integrity isn't good, what results is a business integrity gap. This is the amount and mission criticality of your data. It's increasing, but the having availability, having access to that data, unfettered access, is no longer aligned to your business, the business value of the data. Uh, you're facing an increase in the number and severity of the threats to the data, which in turn impacts the integrity of the business. You can think about it this way. Between 2019 and 2020, your ransomware attacks rose by 62% worldwide and by 158% just in North America alone. Uh, with damages from cybercrime expected to hit $5 trillion this year, uh, up from, I think it was $3 trillion in 2015, uh, the number of ransomware attacks will increase, and uh, newer forms are already becoming more sophisticated and more disruptive. Uh, when you're talking about the, uh, uh, the average uh, uh, cost of, uh, of downtime, it's upwards uh, uh, of uh, $400,000. You're constantly at risk for major service failures stemming from your inability to properly manage that risk and ensure the availability of your data. So what are you left with? You're left with lost revenue. You're left with lost productivity, uh, potential reputational impact, and, and even personal impact, uh, stress, job loss, you know, things like that. So let's drill down a little bit more into that business integrity gap. Um, siloed data increases the surface area for your cyber attacks. Your data silos and the lack of consistent policies across them um, increases the risk of both traditional disaster events as well as unauthorized access to your data, your data breaches, your data leakage, and of course ransomware. Having multiple data silos and, uh, and purpose-built point protection products means that you're unable to identify some coverage gaps. Uh, you're usually left with inconsistent policies across the silos. You've got limited support for data and workloads and really, it doesn't support ransomware protection and recovery in a way that needs to be supported here in 2021. Uh, you've got lack of visibility uh, due to needing multiple consoles or dashboards for your data protection. That means you don't have a complete view of your environment, uh, and uh, you've got incomplete reporting and monitoring, and you've got inefficient processes or dashboards that prohibit your ability to, to check status. Uh, so with a limited or no insight into your data, how do you make that data work harder for you? Uh, and, and again, you know, these limited recovery options means that it's going to be harder and harder to meet your SLAs. You've got limitations as to where and when and how quickly you can restore. Uh, lack of orchestration and process automation means that more of these processes have to be administered manually by your IT staff, which in turn means greater potential for human error and even meeting your RTOs and RPOs can be quite the challenge. So Commvault disaster recovery, where we, where we excel is typical uh, solutions don't really uh, adequately address the needs of business and they leave a lot to be desired. Uh, the obvious challenges including being unprepared. If it's not easy to use, you can bet that DR won't be properly planned, won't be configured, nor tested with any regularity, um, not having a usable backup. Uh, if, uh, uh, if, if you've uh, 
your business continuity hinges on being able to quickly restore your, your virtual machines, your data and applications without breaking the bank. Uh, cost is a huge issue. If you need multiple point products to protect and recover your on-prem and cloud data and workloads, that restricts your ability to achieve cost-effective coverage. Then you've got emerging threats, they're constantly changing, and general uncertainty. How do you know that you're actually going to be able to recover when disaster strikes? So how Convolt addresses these problems, one, through ease of use. We've got easy to deploy and easy to administer DR orchestration that simplifies the recovery and the ongoing management of your data and workloads, regardless of where they reside. Reliable copies, fast, flexible replication helps ensure that you've always got current copies of your data and workloads available to you. Uh, data mobility, application portability and cloud data mobility for flexibility and cost management with the ability to align your coverage, your infrastructure, and most importantly, your storage costs to the business value of your various data tiers. Uh, threat management. Uh, we offer resilient protection and early warning alerts against ransomware and emerging fiber, cyber threats, enabling you to take action far more quickly, uh, minimizing the impact and, and disruption. And then verifiable recoverability, knowing that you're always ready to recover regardless of the circumstances. Our ability our cloud native ability allows you to disrupt the traditional cost structure of disaster recovery. Uh, yeah, like I said, it's radically simple. It's infinitely scalable. Uh, we offer auto scaling and auto power on and off, allowing you to better manage your cost and investment. And uh, we offer the broadest workload support for data applications, workloads, and even SaaS data, uh, hybrid and multi-cloud capability, uh, and, uh, and built-in DUR orchestration. Uh, so whether it's replication, uh, migration, failover and failback, mounting and recovering, Commvault has you covered with a solution that's been fully vetted by both customers and analysts alike. I'm going to turn this over to Pavan next, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about, uh, about how we approach this. Thank you, Dave. Uh, it's a good context on the data management problems that organizations are facing today. And uh, let's further focus on the disaster recovery solution, what we offer today, uh, how it solves some of the challenges that you outlined earlier. Right. Um, so the foundation for the, the disaster recovery is, um, uh, is in the same intelligent data platform, and I, as, you, as you rightly hi highlighted in the previous slide, uh, oftentimes in the today world, uh, cloud is seen as a popular destination for uh, the DR target. Right? Implementing disaster recovery plan using the cloud as a DR target comes with several benefits. Infrastructure comes on demand, scale up and down as per needs, reduces operational costs. Right? I mean, Commvault disaster recovery solution really extends those benefits and cost savings even further. Um, I mean, first when the disaster recovery copies are made to the cloud storage. We do not need any persistent uh, compute running in the cloud. Uh, On-prem compute on production can make the copy directly to cloud storage, like save some cloud costs. Um, Dave, if you mind making a click here. Um, somehow my clicks are not working here. Um, second, when the DR um, instance of the application is created during failover and failbacks, we use on-demand compute, which immediately gets powered down once done. Again, more cost savings. I finally, talking about auto scale capabilities, you could be uh, protecting one few hundred or like few thousands of applications. DR solution automatically scales up or down the infrastructure in the cloud um, required for the DR functioning uh, based on the requirements and needs. Right? So again, optimized performance, balancing out costs. Overall, uh, disaster recovery solution optimizes uh, cloud operations in multiple ways, as I described about um, maximizing cost savings and achieving optimal performance. Uh, somehow my clicks are not working here. <laughs> uh, be, uh, thanks for clicking that. Link. So let's talk a little bit about um, cost optimized cloud data mobility. Right? Um, application portability is uh, another powerful feature of the disaster recovery solution, where they're talking about on prem to on prem or on-prem to cloud, or cloud to cloud, the multiple ways of mobilizing workloads across um, hybrid and multi-cloud environments. Like today, we support various ways, and as Dave outlined earlier, um, we support all major cloud vendors today. And together with the cost savings that I talked about earlier, 
that the DR solution employs. It really makes a powerful tool for cloud transformation initiatives. All right. So this is an important topic. Right? So when we talk about uh, disasters today um, that are affecting the business continuity, they're no longer simply an act of God. Right? I mean, Dave talked earlier on the data sprawl and the data silos increasing the surface area for ransomware threats. Like, how does Commodore DR solution help us recover from such scenarios? Right? When, when ransomware hits an organization, there are three key actions that are required for rapid recovery of the application. Right? First, you need an early detection of the intrusion. So DR solution helps detect the ransomware attacks by monitoring for anomalies at multiple data sources. We check the live servers, we look into our backup copies, look for anomalies, and we alert the admin immediately when, when we suspect there is an attack. Second, identifying a good copy. Like once uh, an attack has been detected, the DR solution, uh, we, we periodically scan the DR copies, right, ensuring consistency. And there's also a, D, uh, a ransomware detection dashboard that helps you in identifying an appropriate point in time before the attack, a good copy to recover from. And finally, rapid recovery. Like once the point in time copy is identified, the DR solution allows us bringing the application online at the DR site with near zero RTOs because the DR solution keeps the the copy of the application, what are the underlying resources, whether it's virtual machines um, or, or databases, right? We keep them ready. So with close to zero time RTOs, we can bring the application live and ready. Um, verifiable recovery, right? Uh, the DR copies that are made not only allow you to protect from disasters, but you could also use them for testing purposes, right? Whether it's a dev test requirement for analytical reasons or for change management, it could, for various reasons that you might have, you could bring the application online at the DR site, right, in an isolated network. Your production instance can still be running and you could use the DR copy for any testing purposes. And once you're done with the testing, you have an option of discarding the changes and even bringing, you have an option of discarding the changes, changes and throw away the copy, or you can I have an option of bringing back those changes to the production if the use case really demands. Right? So the, the multiple options that we provide here, uh, allowing you uh, to, to, to make use of the copies in a better fashion. All right, so all about functionality that we talked about, it should not lead to complexity in the user experience. Right? I mean, setting up a disaster recovery plan is, is both easy and flexible. Right? I mean, easy in terms of uh, configuration and orchestration. Right? You could define, configure the workloads as a replication group. You could define the priority, right? the ordering uh, at which you would want those VMs or databases to, to come back uh, live at the DR site. You could implement a DR policy at the replication group layer. Right? Now, once your production environment is hit with a disaster, we can automatically detect the outage, and we can trigger the failover orchestration. Now, when the outage is resolved, again, it's just one click that takes you uh, back the application from the DR site to the production. Right? It's, it's just a matter of one click taking the application from the production to DR and back uh, to the production from the DR site. Um, and if you need to test a DR readiness, as I said earlier, you could fail out the application into a segregated network while the production is still running. So, so that's the easy part about it. And it's also flexible, right? I mean, if any additional customization is needed, uh, any of the DR orchestration workflows. You can use the APIs that we offer, customize for any special requirements. Right? Entire DR orchestration workflow is API accessible as well. So summarizing the, the key capabilities of the DR solution, um, first, it offers comprehensive uh, protection, like workloads, workloads across on-prem and cloud, whether it's virtual machine, physical server, database, one console to manage all your data, uh, data management and portability needs. Second, it's a powerful cloud capability, cloud capabilities. Like you could implement your DR strategies, prem to on-prem, cloud to cloud, reduces costs while doing so. And finally, continuous replication capabilities that we can offer close to zero RTOs and submit RTOs. Uh, over to you, Dick, uh, to talk as, uh, more about the broader Commonwealth portfolio and the rest of the presentation. Uh, yeah, thanks, Pavan. The uh, our, our DR solution is, uh, as we mentioned, it's part of a larger portfolio of intelligent data services that cover uh, data management and protection, data security, data compliance and governance, uh, data transformation, and and data insights. Um, we are a recognized leader 
uh, in our offering, our vision, and our strategy. We have been continually recognized as a leader for, uh, uh, for data protection solutions. Uh, we've spent an unprecedented 10 years as a leader in the Gartner Magic Quadrant. It was just uh, updated uh, a couple of weeks ago. So it's, instead of nine times out of nine, it's 10 times out of 10. Uh, every single year it's been published. Uh, no one else even comes close. And to be clear, these rankings are objective. They're based on interviews with actual customers, actual users who continue to sing our praises. And of course, we recognize that you have many different environments and workloads to protect and manage them comprehensively can be a challenge. But out of all the vendors evaluated, Gartner in their just, what, just yesterday, the day before, just released critical capabilities report for enterprise backup and recovery solutions has just awarded us highest scores for all use cases. And that includes physical, virtual, cloud, and now the edge. All of these environments for the second year in a row, we must be obviously doing something right. And of course, it's not just uh, Gartner. Forrester has also ranked us as a leader in data resiliency solutions with highest marks in both data sources and manageability criteria, as well as in security, scalability, and corporate strategy. Plus, you've got folks like ESG and IDC and OVA who have also provided us with high marks uh, in their evaluations. Bottom line, for 25 years, Commvault has been innovating in the area of data protection and management, all with the goal of allowing Commvault users to be ready for whatever challenge comes their way. And since we first incorporated way back in 1996, we've experienced tremendous growth, have pioneered numerous industry-shaping innovations, and established ourselves as a respected leader in data and information management. And during that time, we've had more than 900 patents issued, not applied for, but issued. Uh, we've attained and maintained an industry-leading 98% in customer support satisfaction. Uh, bottom line, we don't just promise features that'll be available sometimes in the future. Our solutions are hard at work now in the real world, and our feature set is the future. Uh, our solutions are optimized for this new, highly distributed world in which we live, work, and play, uh, making us a prime choice for organizations whose business vision puts them squarely in that world. I hope you have found this information to be uh, useful, and uh, we're here to entertain any questions that you might have, but uh, thank you for your attention. Absolutely. Yeah, great presentation. Uh, we do have some questions for you. And while we do that, I'm just going to bring up a poll here for everyone that says, what additional information would you like about Commvault? And we'll leave that up while we take your questions. And so um, let's see, first question that came in, uh, they're asking, you know, we've been talking about DR for a long time. Why do you feel that we're seeing such a resurgence of interest? Uh, let me yeah, let me take this one here. So uh, I think number one, businesses are finally uh, getting a, a grip on the value of the data and workloads. I mean, we've been collecting data. You know, all all of us, all businesses, large and small, have been collecting data for years and not really knowing uh, the value of it. Uh, so now you've got uh, you've got data that you can use to inform your business uh, decision making. And so I think that's that's a big part of it. Uh, more and more business is being conducted online. I mean, there's, there's physical retail, for example, that's still being conducted, but the more it gets pushed online, the more value that data has. Uh, and of course, you know, the rise of cyber crane and, uh, and ransomware, uh, COVID, you know, this dramatic increase in remote workers with unprotected endpoints and networks, you know, and it doesn't appear that this trend is going to go away anytime soon. Uh, you know, what with the, you know, these uh, different variants that are cropping up and uh, businesses who thought they were ready to reopen are, are not quite ready. And that just leaves this, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, exposed threat area, this, you know, the, uh, the, the potential for, for attacks. So, you know, if you're not paying attention to DR now, you better start really quickly because it's just it's it's you know it's mission critical at this point. Absolutely, yeah, more mission critical than ever before. Um, great point, great point. Let's see, next question. Uh, you know, with us being a year and a half into this pandemic, is it safe to say that <clears throat> you've made DR even more critical at the average organization out there? What's your take on that? 
Well, sure. I mean, you know, the, the remote workers I alluded to in the previous question, but, you know, also you've got, you know, it's not just these remote, uh, you know, edge devices. I mean, everybody's using Teams, they're using Zoom, they're using Slack. You know, all of this has left security gaps that no one really ever thought about before. Uh, and, uh, you know, especially, again, you know, these, these endpoints and networks. I mean, I've got uh, uh, three, four, five devices that are connected to the, uh, the you know, to the, to the company network. And, you know, I don't think when we first, you know, started this, uh, uh, you know, well, we, we need uh, mobility. We need workers to be able to ac access uh, information from wherever they happen to be, uh, you know, a lot of this stuff was unanticipated and as as you know the as the threats emerged you know people got smarter about it you know but as 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 smart as we can be you know there's somebody out there you know a, a bad actor looking to take advantage of the situation so it's a you know it's a it's, it's an ongoing battle you know to be able to uh, uh not just not just uh you know, fight them off. I mean, we're not really in the business of, of protecting data. We're in the, in, in the business of ensuring uh, recoverability to a clean slate, which is very different from, say, you know, an antiviral solution. You know, but it's just become it's become hugely important, and it's something that you know you can no longer uh, relegate to the back burners. Absolutely, uh, great point. And so uh, there's a, another question out here. They're wanting to really know how, how does Commvault DR stack up against some of the competition? What, what do you feel really makes it unique? Uh, Pavan, you want to take this I, one? I can, I can answer that. Right? Um, as I said earlier, right, it's, it's one platform uh, that really powers backup and recovery and disaster recovery when often organizations are looking for data protection solution. Data protection, I'm using it as a broader umbrella. Right, disaster recovery is not uh, a, a silo requirement. Right, so having uh, a, a singular platform that can address both backup and recovery as well as disaster recovery is a huge asset. Right, and and uh, that, that's that's the first aspect where where we offer significant advantages to what others do. That there's so many point solutions out there. Right, uh, solutions that are working for uh, a specific on-prem to on-prem scenario or cloud to cloud scenario. Right um, now, nowadays, as, as we've been talking about data sprawl, how applications are becoming more complex, data getting fragmented and spread across multiple destinations, you really need a robust and comprehensive solution that can cater to various workloads and not just really specific to one target or one source. Right, so these are some of the great aspects and great advantages of the platform offers and and how. Use, leveraging the platform benefits, we were able to offer the, the disaster recovery capabilities with broad support and uh, workload support as well as source and destination support. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, I'm afraid that's all the time we have here in our live Q&A session, but there's a number of more technical questions for the Commvault team there in the queue. So, uh, again, great presentation, Pavan. Uh, and, and Dave, thank you so much for being on the event today. Thanks for having Thank us. We appreciate it. We appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. For more information on Commvault, check out the Handouts tab right there, and uh, you'll find a link to the Commvault website where you can learn more about the Commvault solution. All right. Thank you to everyone who responded there to the poll. I'll just leave that up while I announce our next Amazon $500 gift card winner. This is going to Neil Appleby from Texas. Congratulations, Neil Appleby from Texas. Still two more grand prizes, three more gift cards to give out, uh, so make sure that you stay tuned for those. All right, and with that, it's now my pleasure to introduce Mr. W. Curtis Preston, Chief Technical Evangelist at Druva. Curtis, it's great to have you on. Uh, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. All Take right. it away. Yeah, thanks a lot. All right, let's get this show started, shall we? So um, um, we're going to talk about backup and DR in a single service here. I, I completely agree with some of the previous presenters that talked about how important disaster recovery has been. You know, I've been in this business, for those of you that, that don't know, uh, I've been in this business for uh, coming up on 30 years, which is a <laughs> Just a heck of a statement to make. And I always thought DR was important, but 
it always, you know, throughout the years, as I met with customers uh, uh, to, to help them, um, you know, make their backup systems better, make their DR systems better. Um, I, I always got the sense that DR was, um, you know, a less important thing. And the reason why I would get that was because that uh, they, they might have budget for backup, but they might not have budget for DR. And so they, they would make sure that they had backup because they felt that, you know, that they had to have that. But when it came to a real DR system, um, so many companies just didn't have one. Their DR plan was a box of tapes in a vault in Iron Mountain. And that's absolutely not a DR plan. That's, uh, I mean, unless, unless you're planning to fail, right? Uh, and when you look at modern day uh, risks to your data, specifically ransomware, the odds of you needing your DR system have gone up significantly. And the odds of you having, you know, if, if you get hit by a hurricane or, a, or an earthquake or a flood, you get a little bit of sympathy and um, a little bit of time to work on it. But when you get hit by ransomware, there seems to be zero sympathy for you. And um, the, the people think that you should have your system up like right away. And, and so this is why, DR is now much more important and having a real DR system, one that can respond very quickly so that you can uh, be able to basically tell the, the, um, the ransomware attackers to go pound sand. So this picture off to the left here, I'm not gonna spend too much time in it, but, but suffice it to say that traditional data protection is complicated. Uh, I have spent most of my career, for those of you that don't know, I, I joined Druva just, just about four years ago, and I've spent most of my entire career on the other side of the fence, helping, right, consulting and working directly with the uh, end user companies to help them make their backup systems better. I know this drawing, right? I know all of the pieces and parts that we put together to make backup systems more reliable uh, and to, to make them scale better. And then, and then later we wanted to bring cloud in and each of those things that we did basically created this monster that is the modern data protection system. You're dealing with four or five vendors, even with vendors that you know, claim to be a, a single vendor data protection offering, you're never using just their product. You're using their product plus a server product, plus a tape product possibly, many of you are still using a tape product, plus some sort of a deduplication product plus some sort of replication products, plus some sort of cloud product, um, and, 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 and possibly an offsite vaulting vendor. You have all of these vendors that you're continuing to work with. And it's, it's just incredibly costly, um, you know, and, and you're, you're wanting to move towards the cloud and the cloud simply just made it more complex. So um, one important thing here is that I do think that you should protect the data where it, wherever it happens to live. Data is all over the place, right? We have um, the, the the data center and now what we call hybrid workloads, which means that some of them are you know some of them are going to be on prem, some of them are going to be in the cloud, and some of them move back and forth. Maybe it'll be a cloud workload. It might be a, a, a IAS product or a service such as uh, Amazon, or it might be a SaaS offering uh, such as Microsoft 365 or or something like that. And then also the endpoints. All of that data is valuable and it, all of it has to be protected. And you, what you need is something that scales uh, on demand, right? And doesn't require you to put an infrastructure. This is really what differentiates us from almost every one of our competitors is that you um, don't need to put in infrastructure to use our, our service. It is a SaaS product. Um, you also pay uh, a consumption model, meaning you pay only for what you actually use, not for what you think you might use. All of the backup products throughout the decades, you buy what you think you're going to need way before you need it. Uh, and then chances are, you know, if you did it right, you probably bought too much with, so you wouldn't run out. Um, and which means you pay for stuff that you didn't use. That doesn't happen with us. Also, uh, across all of these workloads, you get a unified experience. And then also, uh, you, the data has to be encrypted and it has to be isolated and, and immutable once it's stored in the cloud. Um, and then also be able to do point in time recovery. So you get better business continuity, better, better resiliency, 
reducing your TCO uh, and you can move your backup system from um, a, a capital expenditure world into the operational expenditure world, also while improving all of your, your, your SLAs. So this is the Drupal Cloud platform. Uh, it offers all of those things, uh, all of the workloads on, along the bottom there, the hybrid workloads such as you know, VMware and Oracle, uh, Hyper-V, SQL Server, as well as the cloud workloads and the endpoints. We protect both laptops and uh, mobile devices. And the, we always start with backup, right? And it, it is a cloud backup offering, meaning that all of your backups, your, the ultimate uh, receptacle for your backups is going to be the cloud. And again, different than many of our competitors, I'm gonna say most of our competitors, this is our, our cloud account. Why does that matter? Well, it matters for a couple of reasons. One is that you get um, a, a predictable cost model. It also means that you get the benefit of how we have configured the cloud to be the most secure way. Um, you know, there, there are other uh, offerings that allow you to use whatever storage system that you want. We don't do that for a couple of reasons. One is we think it's, it's much simpler this way um, and also much more secure. If you're storing backups in other services or other storage systems, you are responsible for the security of that. Um, and you know, it, it's not typically an area of specialty for most companies. It is our area of specialty, both in terms of how to, to store it, both for performance reasons, availability reasons, and most importantly, security reasons. So basically, you don't have to worry about any of that. Um, you, you simply use our service. And just like you use Microsoft 365 and you don't have to worry about where your emails are stored, it's literally just like that. You just use our platform. Let us worry about where you have to store the data. Uh, we take care of all of that complexity, all of that risk, all of that management, and all of that cost variability that happens with other platforms uh, where you get just a simple bill per month. Um, if it's uh, mobile devices, it's bill and, and SaaS services, it's billed per user uh, that are that's being backed up. If it is uh, anything else, you're billed per gigabyte that is stored on your behalf in our um, offering. Uh, after global deduplication. Then also integrated DR, e-discovery compliance, ransomware recovery, uh, and also long-term data retention. So it's um, a, a very different experience than, than uh, many other products where basically, again, but if you think of like, um, you know, Microsoft 365, you have a single console that you do use to do everything. That's the same thing with us a single role-based centralized uh, system um, with, you know, with a modern console, you get all of the various insights and everything that you would need in one place. And literally you get started in a few minutes because you, there's nothing to install short of the, the, the front end of it, all right? So you, you do need to install an agent if you're gonna back up a laptop. You do need to authenticate us with a SaaS service if you're gonna back that up. You do need to put an OVA into your VMware environment for us to be able to directly communicate with vCenter. Uh, you do that, but everything in the back end is handled for you automatically. And this is a really important thing because there are, we have plenty of competitors that take their product, run it in the cloud, and then your, they run it in your cloud, and then you're responsible for updating both the VMs that those run on, as well as the software that, uh, the backup software. Our backup software is automatically updated for you, um, you know, and, and, and you get the latest and greatest uh, version and platform and features. Think about that. That, that. That's one of the things that always was, one of the things I was always worried about was uh, upgrading and, and, and uh, managing the back end. Since we have all of your data in one place, we can do a number of things, automated ransomware recovery, uh, reducing compliance risk. We also, um, can notice things that uh, because we're looking at all of your data, we can say, hey, uh, you know, in the last six months, the number of files of this type have grown tremendously. You can then with a single click say, I don't want to back up files of that type anymore, or I want to back up files from this server, this directory, and then boom, um, you know, moving forward, that data is excluded from backups and it can be deleted out of your current backups because again, that saves you money. Um, so this is uh, you know, just a few numbers on us, uh, over 2 billion backups a year, 
50% year over year growth. Um, and uh, we're in 16 global regions around the world with uh, 200 petabytes of data under management. Customers love us, so does the industry. Uh, we've got you know, top marks and all of these uh, customer rating things such as Gartner Peer Insights um, and the trust radius. We were um, recently selected in the latest, uh, the uh, Gartner uh, Enterprise Backup and Recovery Software Solutions as a visionary. And uh, we are the only product in there that is, we are a SaaS company. There are some of our competitors who have a SaaS offering but we are the only company listed in that report that is 100% SaaS. So all of our development resources, all of our support resources go directly to that. Um, this is just a, a, a snapshot of that report, of the uh, Magic Quadrant. And uh, I, I think what they really liked about it is this pay-as-you-go model. The idea is that you have backup and DR all in a single uh, platform. Um, and um, looking forward to working with Gartner some more. So let me just talk about the, the cloud-based ER. We already have your data in the cloud. We can then automatically um, create a, a, a copy of your data ready to go in a, a, a virtual private cloud of your choice. Now this is one, so we do store our uh, infrastructure data in Amazon, but you don't typically need an, you don't need an Amazon account to use most of our services. But if you want to use DR, you do need an Amazon VPC because that's where we're gonna, where we're gonna do the recovery. We orchestrate it from beginning to end. Um, and there is a one-time setup that you will go through to decide things like uh, how frequently you wanna update the image, how frequently, um, or how, um, you know, what sort of VMs each VM gets, all those sort of things. And then when it's time to either test or fail over, it's literally one click. And um, we do all of the work in, uh, in advance to, to do that. Now, one thing, you know, other vendors talk about cloud or, or DR, orchest DR orchestration in the cloud. I would simply ask you to ask them, how long does this take, right? Um, if you can, uh, if you do DR orchestration with us, the, the, we have an RPO of one hour and an RTO of minutes. Many of our competitors, their RTO is measured in hours many, many, many hours, right? So look at what the RTO, we can demonstrate that we can do an RTO of your entire environment, regardless of size, in minutes. Um, so just something to think about there. Um, just a, a very happy customer here, Regeneron. I'm sure you've heard of them uh, with, with all the work that they've been doing with COVID. Uh, they are a very big company that uh, has moved uh, hundreds of terabytes and 20% growth year over year. They uh, moved off of a competing platform, lowered their cost by 70% uh, and, and gained a number of uh, you know, nice features as a result. If you're interested, we do offer a free trial. We also uh, have a TCO calculator. Um, I'll just summarize before we get into the, the Q&A, which I'm happy to answer questions. I, you know, we are the only company um, that is doing these workloads as a pure SaaS offering. There, there, are, there are other companies who have some SaaS offerings and they do some of their things with SaaS and they're moving into SaaS. We have been living here for the past several years. This is the only way we do business. So we understand SaaS, uh, I would think better than anybody else. And what that means is that the, the system automat if you're truly cloud native and truly SaaS, the customer should never have to worry about scaling in the back end. Every time I, I, I look and uh, um, I compare us to other companies, uh, either the, the product, if it's not truly cloud native, it costs much more than what we do. And if it's not truly uh, SaaS, often scaling requires interaction between the customer and uh, the vendor, right? Uh, we'd like to add another thousand users to back up Microsoft 365. Can you please install this extra application so that we can add the, you know, these uh, additional users? Us, add in a hundred thousand users. We don't care. I mean, we care, uh, but <laughs> there's nothing that has to be done on the back end to scale that system. It will scale automatically, whether you're backing up an additional user in 365 or an additional data center um, uh, to the uh, to our data center workload. It's all driven entirely by you. And the only time you have to call support is when you just, you have a question. So with that, uh, I hand things back over to David for Q&A. 
Great presentation, Curtis, as always. Uh, we do have some questions for you from the audience. And while we do that, I'm just going to bring up our poll question that we do after each session here that says, what additional information would you like about Druva? And I encourage everyone to respond to that. Uh, there are multiple options available on there. If you'd like to get a personal demo, uh, just check the box. And so let's see, first question I wanted to ask you, um, Curtis, they're asking about how Druva works to protect uh, endpoints. Does it use uh, any sort of agent software? So yes. So for both for any of the endpoints, what you do is you do install an agent. Uh, we support uh, Windows, and Mac, uh, and Linux, and uh, and also iOS and um, uh, Android. And uh, you you put an you put a, uh, an agent on that endpoint. We then back that up uh, automatically from that point. Uh, it, it's managed centralized from that point. The use, the end user doesn't have to do anything, although they can. The, the end user is able to uh, provide additional configuration if they'd like, but generally speaking, all the, the admin has to do is install um, the agent on the laptop and go with the default settings and automatically, you know, their, their most common data is going to be backed up. Great. Great. I like this comment from Robert I want to share. He says uh, he loves Driva, has been using it for a Microsoft 365 and endpoint backup. Uh, so that's great to hear. Um, another hey, question. <laughs> uh, excellent. Uh, let's see, another question they're wanting to know. Um, you said now for cloud backups, uh, they're wanting some clarification. Do I need an, my own AWS account, or does this run under Druva's AWS account? Yeah, no. For for all of our backups, 100%, all of our services and backups, you do not need um, an AWS account. Um, basically, all of our infrastructure runs in our AWS account. Um, the 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 only exception to that, well, actually, there's I guess there's technically two exceptions. When backing up uh, IaaS workloads. Today, those backups are stored in your account. Um, so you already have an AWS account. We're backing up. We're using AWS features in that respect. Today, those backups uh, are stored in your account, although we recommend a separate dedicated account for that as a best practice. Um, and we're moving forward to being able to give you the option to store those, those backups in our account. And then the other exception is DR. If you want orchestrated DR, you will need an Amazon VPC to, to be able to recover that data. Got it. Okay. And then next question, um, they're asking about, you know, what about protecting uh, data, uh, healthcare data for HIPAA compliance? Um, mm -hmm. Can Druva help with that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have a very good compliance story for pretty much any of the um, compliance regulations that you might run into, everything from HIPAA, <clears throat> uh, HIPAA to um, um, you know, SOC 2, uh, you know, GDPR, CCPA, all of these things, we, as soon as they, you know, were out, we were working to make sure that we're making sure that basically the, the big thing with, with HIPAA is about segregation of data that, you know, the, only the appropriate people have the appropriate access to, the, to the, uh, the, the different sets of data, and also that the data is uh, stored in a such a way that it's encrypted. The data is always encrypted. Uh, before it leaves your site, it's encrypted again when it's stored in the cloud uh, using AES-256, using keys that you manage. We never have access to the data. That's really important. Um, that's another differentiator between us and some competitors is that many of our competitors, if they do run a service, they have an admin account that they can get access to your data. And I think that's a very troubling thing from a, from a HIPAA compliance perspective. But we do not have that. We never have the ability to uh, have access to your data. Excellent. And then the next question about dedupe. Does it happen on-prem uh, before traversing the network, or how does that work? So yes, uh, it is source-side uh, global deduplication, which means that it happens at the very moment uh, that the backup begins. We first do incremental forever backup. So we're first backing up only the blocks that are new. And then those blocks are checked uh, for duplicates in the cloud before they're being sent across the cloud. So it, it lowers both the cost of storage in the cloud as well as lowering the cost of uh, the network that you need to get the data there. Nice. 
And then, so if folks want to get started with Druva, I mean, it's a software-only solution, so I'm assuming it would be very easy to do a proof of concept? Well, actually, uh, I'll just correct you slightly. It's a SaaS service, not a software-only service. Um, so, so really, all they have to do is um, to, 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 to use the product, they only have to uh, load the agent or um, uh, authenticate us to a, a SaaS service that we're going to back up. And all of the software on the back end is all just part of the service. And yeah, so it's, it's just, just go to druva.com and we do offer a free trial. Uh, and it literally takes a few minutes for you to back up because again, there's no infrastructure for you to install, design, or maintain. And Microsoft 365 is available to be protected as well, Absolutely. is that right? Absolutely. Microsoft 365, G Suite, or I guess Google Workspace, they call it now, um, as well as uh, Salesforce um, and, um, uh, AWS, uh, VMware, you know, all the, all the other work as well as the laptops and mobile devices that I talked about. Excellent. Well, I always learn something every time we chat, Curtis. So it's, it's great having you on. I learned something again today. Uh, thank you so much for being on the event. Anytime. And thanks to Druva for supporting the event today. Of course, uh, as Curtis said, visit druva.com, uh, try out Druva's SaaS based data protection and DR solution for yourself. Uh, also, check out the Handouts tab there, and you'll find a resource that you can download on the top 10 principles of a cloud-based or cloud backup service. So make sure that you check that resource out. It looks like a very well-done resource uh, with lots of uh, customer quotes and, and case studies, things like that. So I encourage you to download that before you go. And with that, I'll leave up the poll question while I announce our next prize winners. We have... Another Amazon $500 gift card going to Rudy Rodriguez from Texas. Congratulations. And our next grand prize for another 3D printer. This is going to John Rowe from Ohio. Congratulations. And we've got still uh, two more gift cards and another 3D printer to give out. So make sure you stay tuned. And with that, I'm excited now to bring on our next set of presenters from Nutanix and Haiku. Welcome to Hina, Director of Product Marketing and Shiva, Technical Solutions Architect from Nutanix and Haiku. We'll switch on the video now. Take it away. Thank you for the introduction and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today to learn more about data protection and disaster recovery with Nutanix and Haiku. Can we move on, Shiva? Uh, so today the agenda is to go over the Nutanix Mind solution that we have architected together with Haiku and talk about some of the key benefits that our customers are experiencing with the solution. Uh, then Shiva is going to cover about the what and how we build this uh, amazing solution and integrated solution together uh, between Nutanix and Haiku. I'll talk about some of the key benefits that our experience that our customers are experiencing with this solution. Talk about uh, customer reference, and then leave you with some additional resources to learn more about Nutanix Mind with Haiku. So, with that, let's get started. Uh, Nutanix has really pioneered the hyper-converged market and continues to be a leader with a growing customer base of 19,000 customers who really trust us with their critical applications and, and data. And if you are an existing Nutanix customer, you would have really experienced that one-click simplicity and web scale scalability with the Nutanix core platform. But as we look forward, we are going from being a hyper-converged infrastructure company to a hybrid multi-cloud company. And to do so, we are building a single hybrid multi-cloud platform with unparalleled simplicity so that you can focus on business outcomes rather than worry about the underlying infrastructure. And while we modernize the entire infrastructure, uh, um, infrastructure stack from you know, on-prem private cloud to public cloud, data protection is a critical piece of this digital transformation. And that's where Nutanix Mind can really help you simplify your data backup and recovery needs. And in today's section, uh, this is what we are going to focus on. Thanks, Shiva. So to understand uh, 
how Nutanix Mine with Haiku can protect your data, we need to take a step back and begin with the core Nutanix cloud platform. So in any traditional data center, as what you see on the screen on the left-hand side, there are separate silos of compute, networking, storage, and in some cases also virtualization if it is a virtualized environment. And over the last couple of years, Nutanix has really perfected this, this infrastructure stack and has busted multiple of these IT silos by converging all these layers into a single software-defined platform. But there's also a very complex stack of backup infrastructure comprising of multiple point products for backup, disaster recovery software, target storage, and long-term archival of your, of your data. So you can see that if you combine these two pieces of infrastructure, that is your primary production environment and your secondary storage for backup and archival, the overall stack is very complex. It's very costly to manage and it requires multiple specialized teams. There are point products, specific uh, functionality for, you know, they offer specific functionality for backup, for recovery, for storage of these backup, and then thinking about the long-term retention of the backed up data. So what we are doing with Nutanix Mine is that we are really extending the, the core strength of the Nutanix cloud platform that we've built and mastered over the years to now simplify data protection and cloud data management in customer's secondary data centers, which is basically used for data backup and recovery. So what you see here is that Nutanix Mine really inherits all the goodness of the Nutanix cloud platform to make data protection easy, integrated, and invisible. The beauty of the Mine solution is that it is designed to be a dedicated standalone cluster to be deployed in your secondary environments where enterprise backup software from Haiku runs in a hyper-converged manner. So it really serves as a single turnkey solution for backup, storage, recovery, long-term archival of data, and addresses the challenges uh, that we just you know, outlined and brings it all on the single Nutanix platform. But to look at how we really achieve it, I'm going to pass it on to Shiva to go over how we've really you know, uh, designed this turnkey solution between Nutanix and Haiku. So go for it, Shiva. Thank you very much, Tohina. So um, as far as Haiku with or Nutanix Mind with Haiku solution goes, uh, there are some of the high level points that I'd like to start with. Um, our solution is tailor made for a Nutanix Lift data center. So if you have uh, any of your Nutanix comp components running in your data center, I'm talking about AHV or ESX running on Nutanix or Nutanix files. I mean, Nutanix Mind with Haiku is the go-to solution to protect all of your diverse Nutanix workloads in one uh, simplified um, secondary storage with Haiku. Um, and in addition to that, it's not just about protecting your Nutanix-led data center, it's also about protecting more than just Nutanix-led uh, components like non-Nutanix environments like VMware running on your three-tier infrastructure. I'm talking about some of those leftover VMware clusters uh, running in your traditional architecture that you're probably thinking about moving them to Nutanix. Uh, you might also have some physical servers uh, that are going through a specific kind of a roadmap to be converted into a virtual machine. So all of those infrastructures can be protected by your Haiku and Nutanix Mine. Uh, in addition to that, the Nutanix Mine with Haiku is extremely simple to deploy, easy to maintain, and, and it's very quick to upgrade. And from a security standpoint, uh, our solution is probably one of the best because we not only offer the overall uh, air gap backup security, we, we also provide uh, a you know, a ransomware proof backup strategy for all of your primary infrastructure. And uh, when it comes to Nutanix Mind with Haiku, our solution is extremely scalable, be it with regards to Haiku or with regards to Nutanix Mind, where you can really start small and keep uh, adding additional resources as you grow. And the best part is as when and as and when, when you add resources on your Nutanix Mind, you not only increase the capacity, but also its performance capability. And last but not the least, the combination of Nutanix Mine and Haiku is probably one of the most cost-efficient solutions because uh, the, the amount of you know, security and performance that we offer in this combined solution is 
uh, almost like at the fraction of a cost when you try to compare the solution with our uh, you know, contemporary competitors. Uh, so, so that is exactly the reason why we always position our solution as one of the most cost efficient yet an enterprise ready high performance data protection solution. Now, how does it really work in an environment, right? So I basically have two use cases to cover. The first use case that I want to talk about is how do we provide uh, you know, uh, a solid ransomware proof backup strategy for a Nutanix led data center. Now in this particular slide, you can actually see a typical Nutanix environment, right? You have AHV or ESX hosting multiple applications like uh, Microsoft SQL databases or Oracle databases, SAP HANA. And on the other hand, you also have Nutanix files serving SMB shares or uh, NFS exports. Now, what you can have with Nutanix Mine is it is basically a one point or, or you know, one stop shop for protecting all of your workloads on your Nutanix environments. And this Nutanix Mine solution is basically powered by Nutanix objects. Uh, and Haiku, in turn, basically does backup of all of your Nutanix led workloads, be it AHV or applications or your Nutanix file shares in an extremely seamless and high performance manner. And all of these backups are basically performed on your Nutanix Worm storage. Uh, so basically when you have your backups written on your Worm storage, they can be considered to be 100% immutable, which are safe from any of your malware or ransomware attacks. And on top of it, we can also ensure your backups are truly air gapped. I mean, as you can see in this diagram, I've basically done the job of splitting the backup and the management path and your entire network can be isolated from your production environment so that even if your production environment gets compromised, your backups are still secure. And even if your backups are, you know, the security of your backups are breached, we will still be able to retain the integrity of all of your backups stored within your Nutanix mine. So in addition to that, let's say if you wanted to do secondary backups to tapes or you know, secondary backups to unused storage that's left over in your data center, or if you wanted to do backups to the cloud, we can always add additional tiers of backups, be it to your public cloud or be it to your, you know, to your tape infrastructure or to your unused storage. That's how flexible we are when it comes to protecting your primary data center. Now, the second use case that I wanted to talk about is about protecting non-Nutanix data center. So what do I really mean by that? It basically deals with protecting VMware clusters on a, you know, on a traditional three-tier architecture. It could be any storage vendor. I'm talking about NetApp or Pure or EMC arrays. Uh, and um, you can also have the same kind of applications that you would run on your Nutanix environment. I'm talking about Microsoft SQL, Exchange, Oracle, MySQL. And there might also be cases where, where you can actually have some physical servers. There might be a number of reasons why you still haven't converted those physical servers to virtual machines. And you know those are valid reasons, but you still need to protect them, right? So, and, and these servers can be hosting like ginormous uh, SMB shares or NFS exports, or they could be running legacy applications, but we still have the ability to protect all of these workloads that are non-Nutanix, uh, in the same way we protect your Nutanix infrastructure using Nutanix Mine with Haiku, uh, be it with regards to air gap backup security, be it with regards to protecting your workloads on worm storage to protect from ransomware, or tearing those backups to cloud or to tapes or to unused storage. It's basically the exact level of feature and functionality like the way we would protect your Nutanix environment. So overall, Haiku, sorry, Nutanix Mine with Haiku is the go-to solution to protect your Nutanix and your non-Nutanix virtualized infrastructure. So I would pass this back to Tohina when it comes to uh, talking about the value and as a, and and the reasons why uh, Nutanix Mine with Haiku is such a hit or uh, it's a popular solution with our customers. Tohina, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Shiva. No, this is a great overview of the solution. And as you can tell, Nutanix Mine with Haiku is a very powerful data protection solution. Uh, that is really a seamless uh, extension of the Nutanix platform for primary applications and Haiku's enterprise capabilities for data protection. Uh, so the mine architecture you can see definitely helps you to design a resilient antidote for ransomware as mine is designed to be its own cluster that you can air gap and network segment to achieve extra levels of protection. 
So it's a very, very highly resilient and secure platform to store your backups. Uh, also, because of the use of the Nutanix platform, we are delivering a very fast performant and high levels of resiliency to meet or even exceed the SLAs that you might have with, with your customers or with the rest of the business entities that you know, transact with you. Uh, additionally, uh, we've shown you the way in which MIME can help you to be more efficient, and it really allows you to focus more on projects that will help you uh, deliver on your business outcomes rather than spending resources on keeping the lights on. It's very simple to use. It, it, the platform really provides you one-click simplicity of managing both your primary infrastructure as well as your backup and storage infrastructure using a single consumer-grade dashboard. So it's very simple to use in that sense, and you don't require any specialized skills uh, to start using the mine platform for your backups. And in the end, it's all about freedom of choice. Mind really supports a wide variety of applications and services that it can back up. Uh, it has a wide series of cloud archival options. So you can go to either Nutanix objects for long-term archival, or you can connect to public cloud and store your data there. Uh, basically, I would say like colder data, which you don't want uh, on a hot tier of backup, you can always seamlessly tear it off to public cloud. Uh, and uh, again, it is available on many of the platforms that the Nutanix software supports. So think about different hardware platforms that you are standardized on. Uh, Nutanix Mind supports them. Uh, so let's go through a recent customer success story and see how our customers have successfully adopted Mind. Uh, what you see here is an example uh, from Ballister Hermanos. Uh, Ballister Hermanos is the leading food distributor in Puerto Rico and uses Nutanix to ensure an uninterrupted supply chain of businesses and communities island-wide. Uh, by, by using Nutanix Mine with Haiku, their IT team really experiences no interruption while backing up SQL servers and they got an up and running platform to start using within 20 minutes rather than hours or days uh, that they used to spend just deploying the solution with their older legacy data protection solution. So they've really uh, gained some efficiency there in terms of time. Uh, and not just uh, 60 to 70% in time sa savings, but there's also a reduction in recovery time for them, which has gone down uh, from eight hours to 15 minutes. So all these efficiency really, you know, uh, clicks the simplicity, cost effectiveness, and high availability checkboxes for our customer. Uh, next slide. So I think what's really important to note here is that you want to try the solution, right? Before committing, you, it, it's, it's a great opportunity for you to try the solution. And for doing that, there is an option called test drive available. So test drive really uh, gives you an option to configure backup jobs and policies on a web-based trial solution where you don't have to uh, commit to buying any hardware or uh, securing any software licenses from Nutanix or Haiku. So it's just a browser-based uh, trial solution where you can register and get started. What you get is like a four hours res reserved instance where you can go and log in and start uh, playing around with the solution and taking it for the test drive. And that, that's why it's called test drive. So you don't have to really uh, you know, ask for a POC. It's very self-paced, very easy with a lot of uh, guidance uh, and recorded uh, walkthrough of the entire solution to experience it for yourself at your own pace. So I would really encourage you to just spend 10 to 15 minutes, register for the test drive and get started and explore it at your own pace. Uh, and then if you want to learn more about the solution, uh, please visit the Nutanix Mind website. And there's a lot of great information, a lot of good content available there for you to learn about uh, what really is the differentiator and how Nutanix Mind uh, with Haiku can help you simplify your data protection needs. And if there are any additional questions as you go through the test drive experience or you start learning um, from our website or other resources that are available, feel free to reach out to us uh, on the email addresses provided here. So with that, 
uh, yeah, we, we are on time. And uh, thank you for joining us today. And if there are any questions, feel free to reach out to us. So thank you. So let's see if uh, we've got any questions coming up. All right, I do see some great questions around ransomware probably because uh, you covered a pretty good amount of our solution around ransomware protection, Shiva. So I do see a question, let's take that. Uh, the question is what would happen if a malware or a hacker breaches security and gains access to backup stored on worm enabled object storage? Will they be able to encrypt, encrypt corrupt or delete the backups? Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's an excellent question, right? Because um, yeah, no matter how good your security is, there might be chances where the security could be breached and what happens you know, if, if someone who's not supposed to be accessing those backups has gained the access. Uh, the answer is no, they won't be able to do anything because the worm feature offered in Nutanix objects is a hardware level feature. Unlike other solutions out there where they basically offer backup immutability uh, on a software level, uh, this is a hardware level feature, meaning that even if I'm a super admin, right? And even mm -hmm. if I'm able to access these backups, I won't be able to delete or you know, corrupt or even modify those backups or any of the data residing on this worm storage because it's a hardware level feature and the data is integrity is going to be maintained until its retention time. As a matter of fact, like when customers make use of Nutanix objects and when they enable the worm feature, they will be dis provided with a disclaimer saying that, please be absolutely sure about the worm setting uh, especially with the retention, because once you enable that setting, there is no way that you could reverse that. So that's how strong this worm feature is. Yeah, I think uh, I'd just like to add another point that yeah. once the objects in a bucket that has long configured, uh, created, it cannot be deleted or modified in yeah. any way. So uh, except for the time until your worm timer expires. So the great thing about this feature is that even if you have admin credentials, you cannot really go and manipulate any data that's really stored on, on, on that object in a bucket. So in that sense, it really preserves the integrity of your backup data. Uh, and it's like a tamper-proof solution to protect against any ransomware event. I see another question coming up and uh, it's around recovery. So the question is how fast is the recovery of production workloads when they're impacted by a ransomware event? So it, we can actually offer tons of options here, right? Because uh, especially in a Nutanix-led data center, uh, Haiku makes use of intelligent use of Nutanix snapshots and also does have uh, optimized recovery from Nutanix objects. But if you have Nutanix snapshots, then the recovery is going to be instantaneous because A, snapshots by themselves are immutable and B, any Nutanix snapshot invoked by Haiku are basically hidden uh, from a normal user. Like even if you log into Nutanix Prism, you won't be able to view those Nutanix snapshots. They're only accessible by Haiku, meaning that these snapshots are safe, they're hidden. And if, if, if you have basically retained those additional snapshots, we could make use of those snapshots to instantaneously recover all of your workloads. And, and case in point, this actually happened with one of our customers. I mean, I cannot share the name of that customer for obvious reasons, but uh, they were impacted by a ransomware attack. Uh, both of their primaries and all of their workloads were basically impacted. And the only thing that was not impacted was the Haiku virtual machine. So when they called our support, the good thing was they had Nutanix snapshots enabled and we made use of those Nutanix snapshots to instantaneously recover from all of those, uh, you know, uh, all of those infected uh, uh, wor wor workloads uh, from those ransomware attack. Yeah, that's, that's a great story, uh, Shiva. I think we still have time to take one last question. Uh, it's again, uh, I think we've, we've covered ransomware pretty much uh, in detail. So let's take this one. So the question is, since Nutanix Mind with Haiku utilizes object storage to store backups, can it offer similar level of backup performance offered on contemporary NAS or iSCSI storage solutions? That is a very good question, right? Because there is this uh, perception 
that object storage is always meant for cheap storage, right? It's meant for unstructured data. That That's not the case anymore. I mean, Nutanix Objects is one of those examples where you could still have best of both worlds. You can have a storage that is affordable, but at the same time, high performance. Uh, this basically happens in two ways. Number one, let's start with Nutanix Objects. Nutanix Objects really does some clever tiering uh, between your SSD and your HDD tiers, which actually offers a really high level of uh, read and write performance. And on top of it, Haiku actually has optimized its backup performance purely on object storage. So the combination of Haiku and Nutanix objects when put together, its backup performance is pretty comparable and sometimes even better than, you know, Haiku, the same Haiku solution doing backups to iSCSI or NAS based uh, storage. So uh, in a sense, you actually have a true uh, uh, advantage, the best of both worlds, a solution that is cost efficient, uh, a solution that is high performing and a solution at the same time, which is highly secure at a very affordable offering. So, yeah. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Shiva, on that. And, um... Speaking of Nutanix objects, I just want to add that our core differentiator with Nutanix objects is that it's highly performant, unlike many other contemporary object storage solutions that are available in the market today. So while it is great for backup and archival use cases, we have also seen Nutanix objects being uh, adopted for core cloud native and active line of business applications that our customers are using only because it is highly performant. So um, if you choose to use Nutanix Mind with Haiku, which is modeled on, on objects, uh, you will actually see the throughput is pretty high. Uh, we've actually seen pretty good performance numbers for our customers who are using Mind with Haiku on objects. And typically the storage throughput can go up to 95%. Uh, and of course, as you add more spindles and more SSD, your throughput will increase. So as, as Shiva said, I completely concur that it's, it's a great solution where you get uh, great performance, but as well as uh, the total cost of ownership is not as high as uh, a typical you know, uh, NAS solution. Thank you. With that, I think uh, we've covered pretty much all the questions that we have. Cool. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you very much. All right, great presentation. Thank you to, so much to Nutanix and Haiku for joining us. I've just brought up the poll question on the screen that says, what additional information would you like about the Nutanix and Haiku solution? So I'll leave this up here for a moment and let everyone respond to that. And while I do so, I'll announce our next Amazon $500 gift card winner. Let's see, we've got another Amazon $500 gift card. This one's going out to Camilo Sanchez from Pennsylvania. Congratulations, Camilo, Camilo Sanchez from Pennsylvania. Uh, don't forget, we've still got another gift card to give out on the event as well as our final grand prize for another 3D printer. All right, let's get a few more responses here to the poll and then we'll move on to our next presentation. All right, thank you everyone for that. It's now time for our next presentation here on today's Megacast. I'm excited now to introduce Suhas Nayak, Director of Product Marketing at Clumio. Suhas, are you there? Yes, I am. Thanks, David. Thanks. Awesome to be Thanks. here as always. Great to have you. Take it away. All right. Awesome. So, great. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as David mentioned, this is Suhas Nayak at Clumio. And, you know, it's great to have this opportunity to talk to each one of you. And uh, continuing with the theme of our day's discussion, I'll be talking to you about the importance of having a secure data protection solution specifically for the public cloud. And the reason being that more and more organizations are moving their production as well as mission critical applications to, to the cloud and having a solution that protects their data, uh, their cloud data from say compromises such as a ransomware attack is critical. And in fact, as a matter of fact, what we found through our discussions with our customers as well as industry analysts 
is that the number one reason why people are looking for a secure backup solution for the cloud is ransomware, right? So let's, let's start there. Uh, let's uh, see why that is the case. So just wanted to give you uh, some stats that are pretty alarming. Uh, just in the last 10 months, uh, around 140 local governments, police stations, schools, and hospitals have been held hostage by ransomware attacks. And um, it's expected that a new organization will fall victim to such an attack every 11 seconds this year. So these are pretty alarming stats. And even things like, uh, you know, uh, digital currency such as Bitcoin, they are making it uh, much harder to trace, uh, uh, you know, who these attackers are once the payment is done. So it's it's uh, becoming uh, very rampant, and you know, no one is safe from ransomware or such an uh, account compromise these days. So it's 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 top of mind, as I said, for our customers, and. Uh, one of the things that anyone deploys to defend against such attacks is having a backup solution for your uh, primary application or your uh, primary workload, for example, because backups, you know, are your last line of defense. But having said that, what's uh, important and uh, a distinction that I would like to make is that not all backups help you in recovering from such an attack. And I'll go through that in details today. Um, uh, the, uh, the reason being is that the uh, ransomware attacks are becoming more and more sophisticated these days. They know exactly what your your resort is going to be if they hold uh, your data uh, hostage, right? You, they know that you're going to go fall back on your backup copy. So what they do is they spend a lot of time on your network before actually encrypting your primary data and then asking for that ransom, right? And what they're doing, uh, for all these days in a network is, exact, is exactly hunting for your backup copy. And, and so if you don't have a good solid backup solution, uh, the chances are that by the time uh, you know, your, your production data is compromised and you are, you, it's brought to your attention that it's all encrypted, your backup copy is most likely uh, compromised as well. So that's, that's the reason why it's important to make sure that you don't just have a backup solution, but you have the right backup solution that will secure your primary data. So with that, let's look at uh, an example. Uh, I'm taking an AWS example over here as to why not all backups will actually protect you or save you from a ransomware attack, right? So anytime you, let's say, spin up uh, your application in AWS, let's say this is an application in EC2 in one of your accounts, uh, the, the, the next question you get asked is, hey, would you like to protect your application? And you say yes. And what happens is that, you know, uh, AWS automatically starts creating snapshots for your application or your primary data. But these snapshots are all created in the same account. By the way, this is great for operational recovery, so don't get me wrong. So anytime there is, let's say, an accidental delete, and if you want to roll back to a valid good copy um, just an, uh, an hour ago or four hours ago, you can very well do that using snapshot-based backups and so that's why you know, it's great for operational recovery. But it's, it doesn't meet the needs of uh, putting together a full-blown comprehensive data protection plan, uh, something that will protect you from, say, ransomware. And why that's the case? Because as you can see from this slide, all your snapshots are created in the same account that your primary application is running. So if account one, uh, as shown on this particular slide, gets compromised by a ransomware attack, it's very easy for them to go hunt for your snapshot copies and compromise and encrypt them as well. So now you don't have a good valid copy to fall back on and recover from the situation. Uh, there are other shortcomings of this approach as well. Uh, if you were to use this as your only backup solution, number one, if you keep doing snapshots to retain data for years, go back up to like say seven years, it becomes super expensive. Uh, there's no indexing or cataloging done. So if you want to just go find one particular file, that you lost, you can do that. You have to restore, let's say in this case, an entire EC2 instance, load it uh, on another uh, server, and then go dig and find that particular file. Uh, so the recovery process is extremely slow and complex as well. So okay, so what would be the next resort that some uh, people might do is they can now start replicating their snapshots from account one to another account. Uh, but what ends up happening is that when you do that, you have egress charges you invariably are developing complex scripts to automate this replication from one account to another. And by the way, 
you are now duplicating the number of snapshots in your AWS environment, and that's going to double up your costs. And last but not the least, it still doesn't solve the problem that you were trying to solve in the first place, uh, which is say, protecting your primary data from ransomware because the same scripts that are actually, let's say, duplicating the snapshots to another account have the same uh, access and login credentials uh, that can access both account one and account two. So if your account one gets compromised, it can very well lead through these scripts into account two, and uh, your account two can be compromised as well. So it's, it's uh, adding complexity, it's adding cost, and it's not still giving you a bulletproof solution to protect against ransomware, right? So that's that. So in a nutshell, what it means is that if you're using, let's say, just AWS snapshots in AWS, you have insufficient security, meaning it's not giving you ransomware protection. There's no air gap, and I'll get to that in a minute as to what air gap means. Um, you, uh, if you want to restore specific files or data from snapshots, it takes hours. It's not easy, so your restore process is slow. Uh, backups are important, but getting back up and running uh, uh, and, uh, is, is equally important uh, that you do in a quick order of time, right? So that's uh, recovery is important as well. Quick recovery is important, I must say. And last but not the least, uh, it's, uh, it adds up a lot of cost if you just rely on snapshots to implement a full-blown uh, backup uh, implementation in the cloud. So all of this uh, results in a ton of complexity as well. And so what Clunio um, uh, does is it, it basically attacks all those gaps that we've found in the public cloud when it comes to data protection and starts solving them one by one. So let's take that same example that I had shown, which had, uh, let's say, a lot of gaps when it came to protecting from ransomware. Uh, let's take that same example and see how Clunio uh, kind of solves that, right? So for example, I've shown three accounts here in AWS. So with Clunio, we provide you with the same uh, in-account operational recovery as a functionality as well. In fact, we add a lot of um, value-added functionality. We make it extremely simple for you to go search through your snapshots and recover from an accidental error. So we do, we do that, and we provide that for free. We call that as our warm tier. So you can do full point-in-time volume recovery or full point-in-time instance recovery. Uh, we are just managing your in-account snapshots, but making it much simpler to manage, and we are offering this functionality for free. Uh, what we do next is, we now, if you are using Clumio Protect, we ingest your uh, primary data in your account and move it into our Clumio service, which doesn't share any credentials or the security domains with any of your AWS accounts. So once we move this data into our Clumio service, it's as good as an air gap copy over there. So if, let's say, any of your accounts here get compromised by a ransomware attack, there's no way for that attack to lead into the Clumio service because there's absolutely no commonality in terms of the security sphere, if you will, right? So that's, uh, in fact, this is one of the uh, most important requirements that you would see from CISA as well as to what they recommend you have to protect yourself from an attack such as uh, a ransomware having this air gap backup copy, and that's what we provide with Clumio Protect. Next, once we have this data, we do indexing and cataloging. What that helps is giving you the capabilities of now to uh, you know, recover data at a, gra at a much granular level. You can do a global search. Let's say you uh, lost a particular file. You could just do a global search using the name of the file, and Clumio will show you all the different versions of that file that were backed up. You can select the one that you want and then just either uh, download it to your uh, local machine or even securely send it to, uh, some, uh, to your team member, for example, right? So we provide that granular recovery as well. And oh, by the way, as you can see here, there's no duplication or replication of snapshots from each of these accounts. So there's a lot of cost savings, which is like the icing on the cake here on top of all the functionality that you get. And uh, we've, we've had customers that have saved anywhere up to 50% in their uh, backup costs in AWS once they've moved their, uh, you know, their uh, snapshot and backup management into Clumio Protect. So that's how we do uh, air gap ransomware protection in, um, in Clumio. I just wanted to kind of show you all the different level of restore functionality we have as well in addition to the air gap uh, backups. For example, you could 
uh, let's say you know you still lose your data and you want to just get uh, a particular file in your EBS volume, you can do that. You can either search globally, as I mentioned, or we can in, we even give you the entire directory view um, of your file system, so you can browse just like you do uh, on your on your PC, for example. Uh, go into the directory files uh, folders and select a particular file that's uh, that you want to recover and then recover with a simple click. You can even do that for databases. For example, if you want to retrieve a particular record or even uh, an entry within a record, you can do simple basic SQL queries and get that uh, uh, record recovered as well. So you have both uh, global search as well as um, you know, so, uh, selecting a particular record or file that you want to recover. And last but not the least, the flexibility is uh, equally important. Anytime a particular account gets compromised, for example, you don't want to recover uh, data back into that account. You probably want to do, uh, you want to take that account offline and see what went wrong. And you, you should have the flexibility to recover uh, your data into any other account or region, and we provide that functionality as well. So that's the flexibility on the restores. And Clumio is built in 100% uh, natively in AWS. So we have uh, infinite resources at our disposal, uh, such as say uh, serverless Lambda functions. So we can not only help you select the file that you want to retrieve, but we can do that extremely rapidly, the whole restore process as well. So that's the rapid, granular, flexible restore. Then just at the platform level, uh, we have a security fi uh, first mindset when we build our platform. For example, the backup copies, they are not just air gapped, they're immutable. Meaning even if somehow, let's say an, an attacker gets access to the backup copy, they can't do anything with it. They can't uh, encrypt it. It's, uh, it's not, uh, it's, uh, it cannot be deleted as well. Um, you, we have end-to-end -end encryption, meaning we encrypt all data at rest as well as uh, in flight. And you have the, you have the capability of bringing your own keys and encrypting the data using those keys as well. So we have built all these great security uh, 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 features at a platform level to harden our platform at the end of the day. And then it's also uh, you know, certified for all, um, I would say, compliance-related uh, requirements, such as whether it's HIPAA, SOC 2, PCI. So, so our platform gets certified for the latest and greatest security certifications, and we do quarterly or regular penetration tests as well to make sure that it's all up to date. So that's the added layer that we put to make sure that your data is secure. And so in a nutshell, if I had to kind of recap and summarize as to all the different things that are built into Clumio that in turn makes it that secure data protection solution in the cloud. Number one, it's super simple. It just takes you 15 minutes to bring in your AWS environment into Clumio and start protecting your assets. Uh, and we provide air-gapped backup copies so that uh, you, know, you always have a valid backup copy to fall back on if your account gets compromised by something like, uh, say, a ransomware attack. Second, as I mentioned, recovery and quick recovery is equally important for, for business continuity. So anytime you have uh, a data loss, you should be able to recover data quickly. So we provide flexible, granular, as well as rapid recovery. And at the end of the day, our platform is hardened just at a security level to make sure that all the access controls, your data is encrypted, and uh, you know, it cannot be easily deleted and such, right? So that's built at a platform level too. And so with all that, at the end of the day, what you're getting is a, a data protection solution or a backup solution as a service for uh, the pl uh, public cloud, especially AWS, which is a lot more secure than the existing native tools or legacy tools that you might use. Uh, it makes restores extremely faster compared to the existing functionality that you have uh, natively in the public cloud as well. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, you get all these great functionalities and security at a much lower cost from a TCO point of view because we don't do redundant uh, replication of snapshot. We don't have extra egress charges as well. Uh, and so it's, uh, at the end of the day, it's a much secure and a simpler experience compared to traditional cloud data protection uh, mechanisms that are, ex that are available. Right? So I believe that's my last slide, but I want to um, also highlight that as I mentioned, uh, it's super simple for you to go try out a solution. It takes less than 15 minutes to bring in your AWS environments into Clumio. And just you know, give us a test drive. It's 100% uh, it's, uh, 
SaaS solution. You don't have to install anything. You don't have to purchase any hardware. We are available on the AWS Marketplace. I have the link over there on the slide. So just give it, give it a shot. And you also have $200 worth of free credits. So you can uh, uh, you know, try out bringing in your EBS or RDS data into Clunio and try it for a few days, if not weeks. Uh, and yeah, uh, try it out and see you know, uh, how it's going to simplify your life and uh, you know, secure all your data. And yeah, if you have any other questions for us, you know, reach out, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email is right there on the slide or just you know, reach out to us for, uh, using our chat on our website. Okay, so I think, uh, David, I think that was my uh, last slide here, I believe, and with that, I will open it up for questions. Absolutely, yeah, great presentation, Suhas. Uh, I do appreciate that link right there on the screen uh, for everyone, uh, Clumio, or clume.io slash try. If you just click on it, uh, you don't have to try to memorize it or, or type it out. Just click on it right there, and you can try out Clumio for yourself. Um, I wanted to point that out before we move on. We've got a couple of quick polls here. First one uh, I just brought up on the screen. And the question is, which cloud is your organization using? And if you're using multiple clouds, feel free to select, of course, multiple clouds. And we appreciate your feedback on that poll. And we'll just leave that up while we take your questions. Um, Suhas, one question here came in from William who's asking, can Clumio help write protect the backups uh, no matter what, to make sure that the backups are protected from any sort of tampering? And I think you were talking about that, Absolutely, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah but that's a great question. That's a great question, and uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, we understand that that's super important for our customers, uh, and that it's one of the important uh, functionalities to have to protect against such compromises that I, met, that I was talking about as well. So Clumio backups are immutable, uh, so, which means that it is right protected, and so you can't change it, you can't encrypt it. In fact, we don't even allow uh, uh, or make it simple for anyone to even delete those copies. So yeah, uh, the short answer is yes, uh, and um, we, we take our care of, you know, uh, we make it tamper-proof, let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, yeah, I like that immutability. That's very critical uh, to protect backups from ransomware. Um, another question here from Ned, he's asking, uh, does Clumio provide backup as a service uh, for any other clouds uh, beyond AWS? Great question. Uh, not at the moment. Uh, right now we are focused uh, on AWS. Um, we, uh, you know, we want to have a focused effort, make sure that we have uh, all the right functionalities uh, and features for AWS, which is by and large, uh, uh, you know, one of the biggest uh, cloud service providers. Although I'm, see I'm seeing a little bit slight uh, response from the cloud, from the crowd here. But uh, yeah, our goal is to first, you know, nail AWS. Uh, but you can expect that we'll be soon tackling the rest of the cloud service providers, such as GCP and Azure, that we have on the screen here as well. Excellent, excellent. Uh, let's see, Michael's asking, um, what do you see as Clumio's real advantage in the market? What makes it unique? Yeah, so um, number one, we truly believe that there isn't any other solution that's a true SaaS offering in the cloud today. You invariably have to manage additional resources, uh, install an agent, um, um, uh, add additional hardware, and there's a lot of ton of complexity when it comes to uh, using any other solution. And we, our, our goal here is that you, you you should be focusing on your core business and let us manage data protection in the cloud for you. Right? You shouldn't be worrying about these things. We want to take care of that. Uh, the other one is security. As I mentioned, that's top of mind for everyone that we speak to. And there isn't, uh, there isn't any other solution that provides this air-gapped uh, protection from and, and attacks such as ransomware, for example. And it's, and it's easier said than done. And that's why you would see that there aren't uh, a lot of, in fact, there isn't any other solution in the public cloud that does that today other than Clumio. Um, and um, yeah, so I would say the, the, the whole simplicity of using Clumio, uh, being able to protect your assets in AWS in less than 15 minutes and getting that bulletproof security from uh, compromises, I would say is what separates us. And yeah, the faster recovery and I would say uh, the lower TCO is, is, is it's all you know icing on the cake from that point onwards. Excellent. Yeah. W well said. Well said. Um, let's see. Let's move on to our second poll while we 
uh, continue to take some more questions. Uh, looks like uh, Azure and AWS, of course, were the, the two big winners there on the poll. Um, the next question on the screen is, what additional information would you like about Clumio? You want uh, to get some additional uh, pricing details or get a personal demo or try it for yourself? Uh, now is the chance to respond there. We want to get your feedback. Um, Chris is asking, uh, is Clumio cloud-based only? Um, and just trying to understand the question. So yes, uh, we are 100% natively built in AWS. So it's a SaaS offering uh, built in the cloud, and we do data protection for uh, the public cloud as well. So if just maybe uh, if if the the person asking the question was we wanted to know if you protect data for on premises. Uh, or for your uh, local on-site data center, then that's not our focus. We are 100% focused on protecting data in the public cloud, and it's a service that's built in the public cloud as well. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. Um, another question that they're asking here is, how does Clumio uh, protect me better from ransomware specifically just compared to other traditional backup solutions for AWS? Yeah, yeah, sure. So great question. So traditional backups or even snapshot-based backups in the cloud, they are great, as I mentioned, great for operational recovery. But, but there are gaps when it comes to implementing a holistic data prediction solution in the public cloud. A lot of these solutions are just, you know, uh, managing the in-account snapshots. And when they do that, as I mentioned, snapshots are still created in, your same, in the same account as your primary data uh, resides. So there's no air gap or separation of your primary data from your backup copy from domain credential, security sphere, and such, right? So anytime your, your primary data is compromised, the chances are very high that your backup copy or your snapshots are compromised as well uh, if you're using one of the other solutions. And that, that doesn't happen with Clumio because once your, your, your backups are moved into the Clumio service, you have a virtually uh, a, a virtual air gap uh, protection, right? So, so the, the attack cannot propagate from the account that's compromised into the Clumio service. Uh, additionally, as I mentioned, and uh, as one, uh, one of the gentlemen was really you know, interested in knowing whether, uh, you know, hey, can the backups be uh, overwritten and such, so Clumio backups are immutable. So even if somehow a hacker or a bad actor in your organization gets access to the Clumio backup, they can't do anything with it. They can't change it. They can't encrypt it. They cannot delete it. So we've added this additional layer of protection as well. And uh, so, yeah, so th these are the ways that we are separating um, from all the other alternatives that are present today when it comes to safeguarding your data from a ransomware attack. I, I hope that answers the question, David. Yeah, yeah, great answer. A another question here that's kind of similar, they're asking, if I develop scripts already, to handle backing up my AWS data, why why would I want Clumio? Yeah, great question again. And um, as a, again, as a matter of fact, we know uh, a lot of current customers, Clumio customers, who had gone down that path. Uh, either they didn't know about Clumio at that point, or there was no other option for them uh, other than to use scripting. Uh, so there are several issues uh, with going down the route of developing scripts to manage your AWS backups. One, uh, the, number one, you need to devote a lot of time to develop them, as well as to you know, constantly update them as you bring in new AWS assets or retire existing ones. Then uh, you know, there are constantly there are changes to AWS APIs, uh, and so you need to keep a close track of all those changes and then update your scripts accordingly because uh, your scripts are in a sense calling those AWS APIs, right? So you need to be really on top of j not just developing the scripts. It's not something that you would do one time, but you have to be like on top of it, maintaining it and making sure it's doing what it was intended to do, let's say a month ago, right? So it's, it, it's very time consuming and uh, it puts a lot of strain on your resources. Then scripts are needed per account. You can't have like one script that will just, you know, do this global uh, policy management across all your AWS accounts and manage the life cycle of your data. That, that's, that's not possible. Restore, restores are not simple as well. You still need to go to the AWS console for your restores. 
And then uh, there's no like indexing and cataloging. So even if, uh, even after you've spent all this time developing scripts, if you want to just bring in a, a portion of the data, a, a single file or a record, you can't do that using scripts either, right? So, uh, and, and uh, I think the most important one is that anyone who has access to the scripts literally has access to all the accounts. It is creating snapshots in. And so if you, if you get compromised by a ransomware attack, guess what? They'll have access to the scripts and they'll, they'll find a way to go and manipulate your snapshots in those other accounts or even delete them. So it doesn't really uh, protect you from ransomware as well. So, so a, ton of, a ton of issues, and we've seen this firsthand, where our existing customers were really frustrated and they wanted a solution that you know, kind of uh, eliminated this whole process of developing scripts. Yeah, great point. Great point. Scripts aren't uh, very scalable or easy to maintain uh, over time. Um, and then also I'd like this question they're asking about when it comes to uh, recovery, uh, how quickly could Clomeo help us to recover from a ransomware attack they're wanting to know? Um, uh, it, it could be as, as short as one click. If you are trying to just get one particular file, just do a global search. You, have, you can pick uh, from the list of the different versions of that file and then recover it, right? So, yeah, no, seriously, I mean, uh, the recovery times that we've seen uh, our customers uh, bring down is from hours, sometimes days, to just a few minutes. And we have public case studies on our website uh, with these stats. And there are a ton of customers who really brought down their whole RTO or recovery time objective, uh, you know, that they've lowered it significantly once they switched to Clumio. So, uh, a ballpark number, I would say, is uh, from multiple hours to just a few minutes. And as I said, depending upon your needs and your circumstances, if you want to just get that one critical file back and get uh, up and running, it could be just like a single click. So that's how simple and easy it is to recover from a ransomware attack with Clumio. Awesome. Sounds awesome. All right. Well, Suhas, I'm afraid we have run out of time here in our live Q&A session. There's a number of more technical questions for you there in the queue, but uh, I'm afraid we need to wrap up. Um, one, one final question here, back to the free trial, is that um, if folks go to try.clumio.com, that'll take them to the Clumio marketplace, and then they yeah, sign yeah. up for a free trial from there? Absolutely. So uh, either use the link or just if you go to the AWS marketplace and search for Clumio, you'll see our listing. And uh, yeah, just uh, click on the start or uh, start uh, Clumio button or start trial. And, uh, and as I said, it, it's, it's, they'll be up and running in uh, just a few minutes from that point onwards. There's, there's nothing they have to install. There's just a simple cloud formation template that they'll have to um, uh, get uh, configured. But as I said, uh, no additional software, hardware, uh, no, no licenses as well. You just completely cool. uh, pay on a uh, consumption model based on well, you know, how much storage you're consuming. So no licenses, no software, no hardware. Uh, so yeah, just give us a try uh, on the marketplace. I don't think it could be e any easier than that. Uh, and it says here, get $200 worth of free credits when you test drive Clumio. It looks like a, a promotion going on right now. So uh, great time to try it out. Uh, Suhas, thank you so much for being on the event today. Yeah, thanks for having me as well, David. Uh, as I said, awesome as uh, always. And I would also like to thank everyone in the audience for their time uh, to join us as well. Absolutely. And, of course, thank you to Clumio for supporting the event today and for your great presentation. Uh, don't forget about the poll out there. Uh, to anyone who hasn't responded yet to that poll, I will leave that up while we announce our final prize winners. We have our Amazon $500 gift card uh, going out to Kenneth Jansky from Illinois. Congratulations. And our final grand prize, our fourth 3D printer, this is going to Steve Zering from Pennsylvania. Congratulations, Kenneth Jansky and Steve Zering. I will post all the prize winners in the questions pane as well. I want to remind everyone, don't forget about the 10 on Tech podcast over in the iTunes store. If you are a potential sponsor of an upcoming EcoCast or Megacast event, uh, reach out to us at connect at actualtechmedia.com. We would love to chat about having you on. Our next event, uh, our next Megacast 
is focusing in on cloud native data protection and disaster recovery. And on that event, you'll hear from experts at Druva, Palo Alto, Clumio, Rubric, and Kasten. So make sure you join that event on August 12th to learn more about cloud native data protection and disaster recovery. And then don't forget to you know, share the goodness that you've learned on the Megacast and Ecocast or with your coworkers, your IT friends and IT coworkers. After the event, you'll be redirected to our referral landing page where uh, if you'd like to uh, invite them to our upcoming events, that is a great place to do it. Thank you so much to everyone who joined us on the Megacast today on assess assessing and improving data protection, DRAS, and disaster recovery capabilities. I learned a lot. I hope that you did too. Uh, congratulations to all the prize winners. And of course, uh, everyone take care and stay safe. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.